Okay. Welcome, everybody, to the Ways and Means Committee hearing, budget uh, hearing, and capital plan. Uh, tonight, uh, let's begin this meeting. Uh, we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance, and I'd ask you to remain standing for a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I ask for a moment of silence this evening for a fellow veteran who has passed away, Michael Varasso. He is the son of Alfred and Carmela Varasso, a great American who succumbed to cancer. And I ask you to keep him in your thoughts and prayers as we also observe a moment of silence for those serving this country today, home and abroad. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Uh, welcome, Chief of Staff Taub and the rest of the department heads and representatives that were here this evening. Uh, we do have a full agenda. Uh, first up, uh, we will take care of old business. Uh, we have remaining from a capital plan. Yes. Up. Uh, I stand. Yes. Okay. Member Reynolds. Here. Member Flaherty. Here. And Member Maglio. Here. All present. Very good. We're eager to get going. Okay. First up is Old Business 22006, Mayor Request to Approve Fiscal Year 2022 Capital Plan or Take Up Any Action Relative Thereto. Also 22007, Mayor Request for Appropriation Fiscal Year 2022 general fund capital budget or take up any action relative thereto. Motion uh, take off the table order 2020, uh, sorry, order 22006 and order 22007. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you. So first up, uh, Chief, of Chap Chief of Staff Taub, um, I know we have already covered a number of items, if not the majority of items, in 007 uh, general fund budget capital plan. We still have a few items left. Uh, there are a couple of questions that remain from the committee members. Uh, some of those are ADA uh, related uh, across the different departments. We also have uh, questions on uh, the parking lot appropriation for $80,000 and the fire headquarters $7 million request. So I'd like to start, if possible, with the ADA related questions and I will turn the floor over to uh, Councillor Maglio in order to just kind of spell out what those questions are. If, if I may, Chairman Reynolds, before we get to that, um, one of the other items that we haven't covered are the requests for police vehicles and data processing equipment. Yes. We do have the police chief here this evening. If there are no questions uh, as it relates to those items, I would respectfully request that we release him from our presence tonight. Very good. Good idea. We'll take that. So certainly, Chief Du Bois. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome. Thanks. So uh, I guess the way that we work this generally is if you can just give us a little overview of what your requests pertain and any additional comments you'd like to provide for us before we start asking some questions. Sure. The request is just for four new um, Chevy Tahos uh, with all the additional um, upfitting lights, the mobile data terminal, the, you know, the computer in it, the radios, uh, AEDs for that total of 323-817. The actual request initially was for eight vehicles because we weren't funded any last year. Um, so we were trying to make up for it, but um, we uh, are funded for four. Uh, the request is for four. And that's about it. It's pretty straightforward. Very good. Thank you. So I'm going to ask if there's any questions from the committee members. Council Flaherty? Certainly. Um, hi, Chief. How are you? Good, thank you. I'm glad to see you tonight. Thank um, you. You have asked for four vehicles. 
and the, that has been recommended. Can you share uh, the total size of the fleet? Uh, we have about 60 vehicles altogether. Um, so what happens is the new vehicles go into the rotation of patrol. So those are the ones that, you know, fully marked, you'll see all the time for each sector. Um, so there's six sectors plus the plaza. So what we do is we take the new vehicles, put them into service for the patrol. They get the most use 24 hours a day, in, essentially. And then the vehicles that they replace go into a, a, a reduced role of either a single assignment or something like the plaza. So that's how we keep, it's the, the, the most heavily used in, in turn, the need, most needed for repairs, um, mm -hmm. new tires and all those kind of things. So that's why we try and get roughly six to eight every year to replace the whole patrol fleet, um, but four certainly is adequate. So will you retire any vehicles at the bottom of the barrel? Yes, this year we're trading in three um, as part of this. So okay. three of the vehicles get, yeah. They, so you'll grow the fleet by one, mm -hmm. but you'll have four new ones. Um, the fleet will go down by three. And then we also do give them to other departments at times um, if they have a use for them instead of trading them in. But then we'll, yeah. So I. Th um, the number might go up by one, yes, total. Okay, good, one more car for you. Hmm. Um, and you also have an allocation for technology? Yes, um, we just request uh, Bell to analyze and evaluate what we have for uh, all the computers in the station, and they made the recommendation. That was the minimum amount that they recommended for about $23,000. Yeah, so they just go and you know, evaluate what we have and what needs to be updated and replaced. So that was from their recommendation. Okay, and will you retire certain computers as a result of these new Yeah, purchases? they just, my understanding is they just exchange them. They're, they're either at the end of life or they need to be updated. Um, so they're all the desktops for all the workstations. Okay, and you also have money that has been recommended for improvements to the police station. And I have visited the police station and I believe both of the other counselors with us tonight mm -hmm. also yeah. have. Yes. And um, I'd just like to get it on the public record, if you don't mind. Sure. What those repairs are for and why they are needed. Um, I don't know, what, what's the so total amount? Are you talking about the structural repairs to the garage that we discussed? Yeah. So the total amount uh, for those is... I believe it's 100000 100000 Yeah. So I, I think Mike McGurdy could give you this very specifics, but essentially the sally port where the prisoner wagon comes in and we um, bring prisoners into the, into the building, um, the structure there is all cement and it's, it's defective and it... I don't think it's going to collapse, but it needs to be reinforced pretty significantly. So they had a structural engineer in, um, and it needs to, from my understanding, put a steel beam in and reinforce the flooring because that's basically the garage and the gym area that it's over. Um, so that's, that's what that problem is. And we can't park vehicles in there as a precaution now. And it also leaks. So over the winter time, like snow was on a vehicle leaked and all the water went down into the into the basement area so it is a problem but will the repair fix the leak as well as reinforcing the strength of the ceiling I believe it will yes they'll, they'll fix all the is big cracks in the floor itself that's where the leaks coming from mm -hmm. um, and how many steel beams will it take to resolve the issue did the structural um, engineer recommend I believe there's just one steel beam in there but it's going to be supporting the 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 sections of the, it's the floor, and the, the building is structured in a way as this big cement, I, I don't know how you would describe it. That's fine. Maybe Mike can do a better job. Hi. Uh, Hi. Michael McGurdy, um, facilities director. Uh, the original plan calls for two uh, structural beams to be run underneath the deck. There is a deck mesh that has to be installed prior to that. The original plan calls for 16 columns, eight on each beam. We're getting a new set of plans that will decrease the amount of columns because it does affect the new gym that was just installed. So we're looking at 
three columns per beam. We'll split them in the middle. There'll be large beams. So that's what we're looking at. We're hoping to do some of the work in-house that may lower the cost, but we won't know that until we get the new plan. So. So the cost is always an issue because we're dealing with taxpayer money, but the greater issue, in my opinion, is the extent to which it will work, one, and two, the extent to which the repair will compromise the space beneath it, which officers also use. Yes. Well, the plan will not. The one we're going to get modified and updated will less columns, larger steel, roughly the same cost. Uh, so it will not affect the new gym that we put in. Or, or there'll be some minor modifications, but the gym's use will still be at 100% when we're through. Um, so, and the garage will be made safe. They'll once again be able to bring vehicles into it, and we will secure it, and we will uh, make sure it, it no longer leaks. We will epoxy it and uh, make it safe. Um, this is something that's gone over a long period of time. We didn't realize it until this winter when uh, we got the call there was water in the gym. So uh, once we reviewed it, we did come up with a plan, and that's what we put forth here, and those are the rough costs that we have. Okay, so just because I want to be clear on what you're going to do, yes. it's not going to involve us. So it was explained to me that it was going to require a series of beams Correct. spanning the width of the, of the room. But it, now it seems like that's not necessary. No, no, the, they will still span. We will not have as many columns holding. We're going to go with a larger steel beam, mm -hmm. so we will not require as many columns, which will not affect the gymnasium that they have there now. The beam goes across the That is correct. The, the beam the goes across, goes the down. columns go okay. up. We'll have three, one on each end, and there'll be one in the center. Now I understand. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. That is all. all set. Thank you. Council Maglio. Um, I just have a quick comment. I've been there as a guest um, a couple of times in the past uh, couple of months, and I'm happy to hear about that adjusted plan because I know how um, important the gym has been to building morale and, and teamwork and camaraderie amongst the crew and that people were really utilizing that, and that, would, that was going to be the thing that would have been lost with the earlier yeah. plan. So I'm happy to hear that there's an adjusted plan. Is there a sense of when this will happen? Uh, yeah, funding, and I think he's waiting on that other plan. Certainly. Uh, basically, we're waiting on the funding, and then we will uh, immediately put the plan into effect and uh, purchase the uh, steel that we need and uh, do the footings as needed and see how much work we can do in-house, hopefully. Uh, we can do more of it in-house than uh, we originally anticipated, but uh, as soon as we get the approval, we'll uh, get right on it, priority one. Excellent. And is there a sense of um, how long a project like that would take? I would imagine from start to finish, if we can get all the materials on board, it would be about a two-week process. Wow, that's fantastic. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you. you. That's all Thanks, I have. Thanks, Mike. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> So, Chief, what's the typical life of a vehicle? Uh, we have some that are over 10 years old. It, it, it's really not the life, it's kind of the, the usefulness mm -hmm. and how frequent they get used. So, the, like, the patrol, a brand new vehicle will go right into patrol, it'll be 24 hours a day for about two to three years. Okay. And then when we replace it, it goes into, a, like, a secondary role of either like the school resource officer would only, you know, that'd be the only person who would use that vehicle. So there's secondary roles that they, they kind of get filtered to. Okay. We try to keep them as long as we can. As long as they're not, you know, um, the maintenance costs don't get um, too much, we keep them for quite a long time. And the maintenance costs, they're done in-house? Or do you have a, uh, a part of your maintenance costs depending upon the level uh, of work needed that you have to send out? I, I would say some very minor stuff is done in-house, but it's mostly all done um, through local garage. Okay. All right. And that's just because of the non-availability of the qualified uh, mm -hmm. mechanics to work on the nature of the things that... Correct. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and I do see that um, you've got a pretty steady <clears throat> projection forecast out over, uh, through fiscal 26. Uh, so you've got a good program, it seems, in place as far as vehicle... Um, 
maintenance and, and replacement. So that program yes. looks pretty solid. It is, thank you. Okay. Uh, and from the computer standpoint, I also see in looking at uh, your forecast out through 26, um, last year, I should say this year, uh, is 45, excuse me, what am I looking at? 22, 23, we got $21,000 data processing equipment, unless I'm on the out, is it 23? So the original request, I think, was for double. Yeah, it was 40. Um, and so it, based on available funding, it, it's 23,000, which will fund 14 desktop and laptop. Okay, great. Okay, and again, I just want to note, uh, you do have a forecasted out through 26 for a steady $21,000 per year. Um, and is that addressing your entire uh, IT needs uh, as you anticipate uh, the life, I guess, the effect of life of the technology you have? Yes, I mean, that, that's just a, a normal replacement process. So they just um, estimate how many laptops or desktops we're going to have to replace, and it's just an estimate for the projection. Just okay. kind of give us an idea. But we do routine, every year we do replace, like this year it'll be 15, 14 um, different um, Okay, so that sounds like more your front-end user needs. How about your server needs, Any, uh, anything like that? That's all done through Build. So it's all through Build, and that, again, I guess this might be for a cheaper staff, Tob. Is that cost covered through uh, the service agreement between the town and Build? That's correct. The town covers the IT needs town-wide for everybody, okay. for all the and departments. Okay, so if there was to be any kind of a replacement or perhaps a migration to a virtual server, if that isn't already the case, that cost would be borne by Beld? Well, it would be likely borne by the town to Beld, and Beld would perform the services. Right. Beld has also provided, I think he's um, a technician that spends a good majority mm -hmm. of his time at the police station to address their needs as they may come up day to day. Okay, great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, generally, that's all the questions. Well, actually, one more question concerning the building. Uh, and so this, again, this may be more towards uh, Mr. McGurdy uh, to answer the question. Um, out of curiosity, I, obviously I'm in support of the need uh, to uh, correct a problem, a serious problem with the functionality of that building and also personnel safety. Uh, what overall is your um, assessment at this point of the shape of that building um, as we look out over the next five years? Well, the building obviously it is undersized for the use in the size of the department that's in there. Uh, we've done a lot of modification work for them. It's difficult to work. Uh, a lot of the wall systems that are in there are antiquated. You cannot get parts for them. So we have to uh, mix and match and come up with our own designs every time there's a modification and it's quite often. The structural issue that we have that we've talked about earlier was something that was unforeseen. It was a, uh, it was a, they call them planks, the precast concrete slabs mm -hmm. that were put in place. This just happened to be a defective one that over a period of time just finally gave way. So in general, the building has a lot of uh, faults. The, the heating and cooling system is completely shot. It's running, but it's not properly installed. The, the building's been modified so many times that they've not correctly uh, put the proper ductwork in, sizing controls and so forth. The rooftop units need to be replaced. Um, the plumbing is uh, functionable, but uh, could use an upgrade. So in general, the building is in uh, more towards poor condition than, than uh, you could say uh, satisfactory. Are you familiar what year that was built? I'm I believe say that was the same year as the high school. 70, 72. 72. Well, it was opened in 72. Correct. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And we know that the police force was a smaller force at the time. They were. Different set of uh, needs. Correct. Okay. And, and yes, thank you. You've answered my question. It's just one more follow-up for the chief, if yes, I sir. may. Thank, thank you. you. Chief, uh, as Mr. McGurdy touched on, you know, the needs uh, of space in that building. Mm -hmm. Um, presently, you are challenged? Definitely. Or you're definitely challenged, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. And you could see a need for a, for a um, just say, a, a greater space 
a more efficient space for the department's needs going forward. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. It's just uh, I'm just trying to get a sense. You know, we are. You know, we know the town has a lot of infrastructure challenges ahead of us. There's a lot of old buildings that need replacement, need mm -hmm. upgrades. We'll be talking about one very significant one that we absolutely need to address with the fire department headquarters. Um, so again, just to get a sense, this is the time to do it where we're looking at a capital plan out over a five-year period. It just gives us a little bit more information and perspective to mm -hmm. go with. Thank you. Appreciate okay. your answers. Um, I don't have any further questions regarding the police uh, uh, capital budget. I don't know if any of the uh, fellow committee members at this point? No. So I think we're all set. Great. Chief, thank you for your thank time. You. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, I'll consult with Chief of Staff Taub. Would you like to proceed with the ADA related questions? I will defer uh, to the committee's preference. It was only because we didn't have, I wasn't, I was unclear on the status of the police request, so I wanted Got to it. make sure we address that. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I am going to turn the questioning over uh, at this point to Councillor Maglio. She seems to have some, some uh, specific questions that she can start off. Sure, thank you. Um, so thank you for the response you sent to the questions um, from last week. Um, but I still am confused. What I, when I look at the capital um, budget here, <clears throat> I see 100,000 in municipal license and inspections for ADA accessibility townwide. I see 80,000 and the explanation for that was the parking, paving the parking lot, the town hall parking lot for 80,000 to improve ADA accessibility. 40,000 in the highway fund for ADA compliance issues and then 50,000 in recreation for ADA compliance issues. And the more we do for ADA compliance, the better. As someone who sat at those meetings now for a couple of years, um, I know the needs are great in the town. What I would like to know is, are those just funds that people can pull from when there's a need? Um, or are they to, because there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of possibles as to what they could be spent on, but nothing definite. And I'd really like to know specifically what this $220,000 is going to do to improve accessibility here in Braintree. Certainly. So I will start by just speaking um, more generally, and then I will invite uh, we have with us Mary Beth McGrath, Director of Municipal Licenses and Inspections, Jim Arsenal, Director of the DPW, Ben Hulk, Assistant Director who also oversees Highway, John Thompson, Assistant Director who oversees Engineering. Uh, we also have Mike McGarty from Facilities, Russ Forsberg, uh, the Building Inspector, and I, I think she's here just as an observer today, but I do want to recognize Christi Christina Zanetti, the ADA Coordinator, who's also with us, and I think that's everybody. Um, so. What we've, what we've provided to date is um, the large-scale projects that we anticipate undertaking in the coming year. Those are the walkway surfaces into the restrooms at Sunset Lake, resurfacing the town hall parking lot, um, making modifications and upgrades to the handicap ramp, purchasing accessible equipment for the parks and playgrounds, which Chris Griffin had talked about at a previous meeting, and then uh, using any additional funds to address projects or needs as they present themselves. And so the, the needs can present themselves in a, in a wide array of fashions. They can come through the Commission on Disabilities. They can come through a, a resident concern that's sent to the mayor's office or to one of the additional um, departments uh, that would be involved in something like this. And so there are some specific projects identified, but then there's also maintaining these accounts to address matters as they present themselves. And so to that end, we also provided the committee with a kind of a look back on some of the projects that have been funded using the various ADA programs, also noting that the $100,000 that's specifically allocated within municipal licenses and inspections is, is really a supplement to the funds that are appropriated to the other departments as they move forward with these projects. So um, as for specific detail on each of those items uh, through the chair, I would invite the department representatives uh, to address with more specificity some of those items and hopefully address your concerns that you've raised this evening. Take 
Director McGrath. I'll take um, perhaps Mr. Hulk and Mr. Thompson. And then I'll ask uh, Director Arsenault, Mr. Forsberg, and Mr. McGurdy to jump in as appropriate. And I will take a seat back so that you can hear directly from these individuals. Go ahead and Take it away. Okay. Thank you. Thank you uh, for entertaining us this evening. I appreciate the opportunity and to be with my colleagues. Uh, as was mentioned at the meeting last week, there are four particular projects that my department is interested in working with the other departments on. Again, we, um, the program that we have through my department, ADA Compliance, is to enhance projects that are currently going on through the DPW department. The four particular ones that we are working with the DPW department on are the uh, accessible pathways into the Sunset Lake bathhouse. I'm working with Mr. McGordy on that with facilities. That is going to cost approximately between 15 to 20,000. 15 to 20? Thousand, yes. The town hall parking lot resurfacing, which would, is being under, overseen, excuse me, by the Highway Department and Engineering Division will run, it's by understanding, at minimum about $110,000, if not more. Again, costs of materials are only increasing, so that is a factor in all of this. And so the amount of, they're requesting $80,000 for that project. I would like to enhance that, the remainder of $30,000 from the ADA compliance money to bring it to at least the $110,000. The replacement of the deteriorating town hall handicapped ramp entrance into Cahill Auditorium. I know that there was some discussion at the last meeting about consideration of looking at ramp access either the front of the building or the side of the building as opposed to Cahill Auditorium. And that's certainly been considered and reviewed with the mayor, with Ms. Taub, with Mr. McGordy, and the inspector of buildings, Russ Forsberg. And some things to consider with that. The f we'll start with the front. The front entrance, uh, first of all, wholesale removal of the colonnade or the columns will have to occur in order to accommodate an accessible ramp. The overhead would have to be re-engineered, and the estimated cost of that project would be about $550,000. The side entrance, many things would have to occur there. There's quite an extensive project that would have to occur there. Number one, the port cachet would be lost in that project, so that would have to come down. The landing area where Mr. Casey has his office, the steps from that hallway, you go down two steps to a landing and then to the door. That would all have to be re-engineered because it would all have to be at the same level. With the engineering and implementation of that project, it would be in excess of $700,000. The consideration to wholesale remove and replace the Cahill Auditorium ramp entrance is something that could be done primarily in-house with facilities, highway engineering, DPW division staff. The cost would be approximately or in the, the range of $200,000. And the individual department representatives can speak to that more clearly. The difference between the one important distinction that needs to be made is that the Cahill entrance can be done with majority in-house staff and resources. The front entrance and the side entrance would have to be engineered and implemented through outside resources. And then the remaining thing, if dependent upon what the amount is that is utilized for Sunset Lake, we would like the ability to be able to assist the Recreation Department with potentially purchasing accessible equipment with the remaining, if the Sunset Lake project goes 15,000, then we would have 5,000 remaining, then we can assist the Rec Department with the purchase of accessible, or assist them with the purchase of accessible equipment. Uh, 
<clears throat> okay. So I guess then what we're talking about is appropriating money to one department in order to allocate it to other departments depending on what the requests are. And I'm not sure why that money, if money is, is needed for accessible playground equipment through the rec department, why wouldn't, why wouldn't that just be appropriated to the rec department? I'm unclear as to why the money is traveling between departments. Well, the other departments have specific requests that they may entertain each year for specific projects. What I do is I connect with the departments and identify what their potential projects are and the needs that I can assist them with to complement their projects. So if they're running, for example, the, the Town Hall parking lot, they're requesting $80,000. The project's going to be at least 110000 I could provide the ability to, to cost, you know, to fund the, the remaining portion of that. So I guess I'm, un I'm unclear as to, and maybe this could be something that you can't answer, but then why wouldn't they request 110000 I guess this is a process question. I think you'd have to speak to that department about that. Okay. Yeah. Why would you not request 110,000? So it's just uh, the funding levels weren't, weren't there for us, so we just uh, provided the funding that we thought, you know, we could try to get by with and, and live within our means, sort of. So, um, so that's kind of the level we, we put it at. We knew it was 110, but we just, uh, you know, couldn't get there, so. Okay. Um, in terms of the Sunset Lake, um, how much money is being contributed for that by the Commission on Disabilities? None. Well, they, the, the, this is for the bathhouse, strictly for the bathhouse, the walkways into the bathhouse. The Commission on Disabilities had endorsed money, the mayor approved it for the playground walkways, pathways, and that's act, the majority of that's done with just the remaining piece is the striping of the parking lot. And the Commission on Disabilities funded $23,467.92 of that. And, uh, of which? The handicapped parking funds. Okay. So they funded 23000 of the handicapped parking. For the playground. Mm -hmm. This is for the Sunset Lake bathhouse walkways into the bathhouse. Mm -hmm. And what is that surface now? I believe it's concrete. It's concrete, concrete. Yeah. and and that this was discussed at a commission meeting, I recall. Um, but what is that final? You mentioned it's fifteen to twenty thousand for that. Mm -hmm. What what does that cover? The replacement of what's existing there right now, replacing it with new accessible sidewalks that are flush right into the restrooms because now they're not. And is that done in house? Yes. When work is done in-house, and this could be to DPW, this could be to anyone, um, and these are priced out, are there, are, is there paperwork? Is there a paper trail that shows what the costs are? I mean, yeah, the invoices and everything for any supplies and everything purchased, we keep a general log of, you know, how long the jobs take. Mm -hmm. And then if ADA compliance is an add-on, I would imagine that there may be a precedent that in the past there's money appropriated that can be used to, to put toward different projects and would there be a paper trail of what projects funding was used for in FY22, FY21, etc.? Yes. Is there a way that at the committee could get a copy of that? Sure. I mean, it would be from different departments because mm -hmm we all are involved with these projects. Okay, so, so I'm not sure how to re make that request. Do I make it through the chair or through the chief of staff? Consider it made. Just please identify the years you'd like the information. 2021-22. Uh, It would technically, because this is the capital plan for 22, so in existence would be FY20 and FY21. Right, right. Okay, thank you. And that would be just these, these funds that are available to be put toward ADA projects.
projects. Yes. Yeah, so the, the three ADA lines that exist um, in the FY22 capital plan are consistent with the lines that have existed uh, year over year for as far back as I can recall. So we can pull from those same accounts and provide an expense report for where the funds were spent. Excellent. That's what I'm really just trying to get a feel for, how this, how this particular piece works. Sure. Um, in terms of the, the front and the side, where have those estimates come? Those are pretty sizable. Mm. That's with review from Mr. McGordy and Mr. Forsberg. Mm -hmm. And I guess my concern is, and the reason that I'm um, questioning the ramp, is that the ramp leads to the back door, and that just doesn't meet ADA compliance. Whether the ramp is in compliance or not, the ramp itself leading to the back door does not does, is not compliant with ADA laws. So my concern is you mentioned that the back might cost up to about 200,000. Mm -hmm. So putting 200,000 into something that just doesn't meet law, I think somebody's going to oh, okay. add a comment. <laughs> Um, when the chair uh, recognizes the uh, inspector. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members. Uh, Russ Forsberg. Um, so, with respect to your, your question, your inquiry relative to uh, not compliant with ADA standards, um, the there is no primary entry as defined under ADA for the town hall building. So, therefore, any entrance um, in accordance with the past findings of the uh, Massachusetts State Accessibility Board is deemed to be compliant. So uh, while um, not the um, most frequently used door, it would uh, be considered to be acceptable in terms of the Massachusetts ADA, uh, I should say, Massachusetts Architectural Access Code under 521 CMR. 521 CMR. That's so correct. what does thank you for that. So what does that mean in terms of if if the entrance is supposed to be to the to where every, if if an ADA entrance is supposed to be equal to the other entrances that people use so that they come into the first floor or they come in through the front building um, front of the building how does how is that how does that meet that code uh, simply because it is a readily accessible uh, pathway to and into the building uh, is what is actually required. Um, I think a lot of times people perceive that the uh, ADA requires it to be a primary entry. We have to remember within this particular building we actually have four entries uh, that are used in, in, I won't say identical uh, times, but uh, in fact because we have two entries to the side, one to the front, and um, one one to the rear Sakale Auditorium. And as a matter of fact, I think if you were to survey uh, the comings and goings of Town Hall, you'd find that the actual front entrance is perhaps used maybe third most, but it might otherwise be looked at as a primary. But in accordance, we, we actually had a case um, for the Braintree Housing Authority back in 1997 in which they had a um, uh, clubhouse which had entries to either side. And the ruling of the accessibility board for the state at that time was that there is no, quote, primary entry. And so either one was deemed accessible in terms of making allowances for persons with mobility disabilities to access the building. And that was 97? That was in 1997. Correct. So, okay, that's helpful. Um, so I guess in terms of regularly accessible, um, so there's the front, there's the side. Are you counting that as a side or a back? Um, I suppose ultimately it's the, it's in the back of the building, and that's the back. Correct. So those are the four entrances that you're um, referring. Actually, to. Uh, there's a um, low entry to the, in the side under the porte cachet, which public and uh, and uh, uh, employees use, and that is ramped as well. So uh, there's effectively four primary entries to the building: front, the two side, and then what we'll term the rear entry into KL Auditorium. And was a waiver. Did, you, did the town have to get a waiver in order to have that back entrance be considered a primarily accessible entrance? No. No. Hmm. 
Okay. Right. Um, and and um, uh, as, as the committee might be aware of, we have commissioned a um, study on all town buildings uh, and to assist us with our transition plan. And um, I believe they have done a survey. I can um, inquire further with, they have? Okay, yeah, they did do a survey, and so we are waiting that to come back, but um, preliminary findings don't, haven't determined that there is a deficiency relative to accessibility to the primary structure, so. This is the um, scan that was done five years ago? No, um, it's mo most recently um, we um, put out a bid and received a, uh, a uh, company to do an assessment in conjunction with the ongoing transition plan, uh, assessment of all um, town buildings and, uh, and holdings, lands, parks, that sort of thing there. And I believe one has been, uh, a survey has been completed for actually for town hall and uh, at least preliminarily, I do not believe they have uh, uh, called into question the accessible entries uh, currently provided to town hall. Okay, that's, that's good to know. And wh when will that information be made available? The hope is that they would finish their surveys by June 30th. Finish that's their surveys, the meaning surveys the consultants? by June 30th of this, this coming year. And th that the consultants will finish the survey? Yes, and then they would produce their report for us. Okay, so I get a little confused between the different surveys. So there's a consultant company that's looking at collecting data about ADA accessibility. Mm -hmm. Then there's a transition plan that was part of the sidewalk scan that the consultant is then going to use to add to this survey? This is the same consultant company. So they're doing surveys of the town hall buildings and holdings. The street scan is also part of that. They ha so they have all of that information. They've received all of that information from the town. Okay, and the street scan is the one they just did? It was done probably Three years ago? I'm sorry, it was done. I believe it was done about two years ago. I apologize to be camp for switching mic. So we've talked a lot about the, um, the transition plan, which uh, exists in draft form and has for some time. Several years ago, the street scan project was completed, which um, was a review of all of the sidewalks around town as part of that transition plan. And that, I believe, was funded in part with ADA capital funds that we've been talking about this evening. In order to complete the transition plan, the town was awarded a grant in the amount of $50,000 from the state's Commission on Disabilities. Uh, that funding has been used to retain a consultant, the International Center for Human Design, uh, a, an organization that's main focus and priority is assisting communities with this type of work. What they have done as the consultants on the project is conducted a survey, not just of our buildings, but they have also met with all of the department heads and have sent out surveys to other individuals to gather information they've deemed necessary in order to complete the transition plan. So they will take all of the new data that they've gathered, plus the existing data that has been gathered over time, and use that to formulate a report that will then serve as the final Town of Braintree ADA transition plan, setting forth priorities for projects and necessary enhancements that they recommend be made and the order within which those are addressed going into the future. Got it. So, preliminarily, we're learning that they're saying that accessibility to town buildings, this, in, this included, is not something that's been raised as a concern so far. Not at this time, but we, we're waiting their report once they finish the survey of the town buildings and holdings. Mm -hmm. Are they also surveying playgrounds and recreational areas? And yes. So will these funds be, will, will they be used for their findings, to, for plans to, to go about and execute some of the things that are in the plan? Or are they being, are, are, are the, the projects that were on this list not part of what they're working on. So certainly if the, if the recommendations and the priorities identify a need that we have not identified, there is flexibility in the funding and the ability to pivot uh, and address those perhaps unanticipated and higher priority items. That's part of the reason why the funding is appropriated in a general category to allow for flexibility. If tomorrow somebody came forward and said, 
this building is absolutely not accessible, you have a problem, raises a red flag, and it needs to be fixed. The ADA capital funds, regardless, with the exception of recreation, because that's specific for playground, would be able to be utilized to address that priority at the time. So somebody who has an accessibility issue can come to town hall and say, hey, I have an accessibility issue and those funds will solve their issue? So I'll give you an example um, and then I'll ask, even though I took his seat, John Thompson, to help me out. Uh, recently, a vision impaired resident raised a concern about a, uh, access to an intersection near their residence. That concern, in order to take action or implement the request to change, has to be re reviewed at task in order to ensure that what they're requesting is appropriate given the size uh, of the intersection and the location for the uh, requested piece of equipment. If task determines that that is an appropriate adjustment or accommodation to make in that neighborhood, then funding to support that project would, could absolutely come out of any of the existing ADA capital line items that have already been approved. And what is that process? Once task makes that determination, what is the process for approving? So task those funds? would uh, make a recommendation to the mayor that this that the inf this complaint or this issue was raised, and it is their recommendation that the fix be implemented and then the mayor would authorize the department to move forward with the expenditure. Helpful, okay. And what if it's not something related to traffic? I suppose it would depend on what it is. Um, I would expect the majority of these types of items or concerns would funnel through the DPW, and so it would be reviewed by the department representatives that you have here this evening. They would make a recommendation to the mayor. Um, or I think oftentimes we'll simply make the determination themselves based on their expertise that it's an appropriate use of the funding and a necessary uh, enhancement and they would move forward with that work. Okay. Yes. Is there any, um, you know what, I, I'm gonna hold off for now. Thank you. That was very helpful. Although you just came up to the table, if you'd like to weigh in on anything, I Mr. Could, Thompson. Uh, so um, I came up just to assist um, um, Solicitor Taub, if, if uh, or Chief of Staff Taub, I should say. <laughs> Either if, one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, but no, she explained the, the the process very well. So I have nothing to add unless you have any additional questions. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to pause for right now and turn it back to my thank you colleagues. Councilor Flaherty, any questions? Thank you. I, I do have some questions. I have some specific questions and some broad questions. And as you were going through, um, Director McGrath, some of the items on the list that was provided to us, you uh, provided some costs. And then, so I caught the cost for accessible walkway surfaces, surfaces into the public restrooms at Sunset Lake. And then I also caught the cost for the town hall parking lot. But I didn't catch the cost. You were talking about the increased cost of a front ramp for oh, right, right. Town Hall. And I, I would like to mention that. So the cost that I would be looking for to contribute to facilities for a ramp would be 50000 Okay. And 50000 for it. And that would be on the side, to repair the side ramp. The existing exists. ramp into Cahill. Okay. And then the purchase of accessible equipment for parks and playgrounds, how much is thought to be allocated for that? It just depends on if the Sunset Lake project goes 15,000 or 20,000. If it's 15, then I would have 5,000 available to assist with helping the rec department with accessible equipment. Oh, if it goes 20, that's the So we own the, the accessible equipment, first of all, is intended for Sunset Lake. It could be for Sunset Lake. It could be, there are other parks as well. I mean, that's, I would work with Mr. Griffin on that to identify the most pressing priority needs for which parks he's looking at. But you don't know Ideally, that I mean, sir, I don't know which location it would be. Okay. So we don't know the location of the equipment that we might buy, and we don't know how much money we would spend on it because we're not sure how much the Sunset walkway, Lake. The walkway yeah. will cost. Mm -hmm. Okay. I believe also from the very that at the first meeting where Mr. Griffin was present, he did identify specific parks that he has plans to purchase equipment for with the funds that are specifically allocated through the Recreation Department. Uh, and I can circle back with him and confirm that as well. Okay. So she's only speaking 
with regard to the $100,000 that we are allocating to the municipal licenses and inspections, correct? And the other $90,000, which is allotted to other departments, would be determined by other directors. Correct. I, I think it's it's 50,000 through highway and 40,000 uh, to it's reverse 40,000 to highway and 50,000 to parks and recreation. Uh, and Mr. Griffin, I think had ident had already identified and I don't know if Mr. Hulk can can confirm the the locations that have already been slated for repair. Okay. Hi, good evening again. Um, yes, um, we're expecting some work to commence this spring and summer on a number of parks. We do have two more that we have already slated that we need specifically that um, the 50,000 in the rec line in the rec department um, to finish two parks, Berwick and uh, Davis, or Faxon, Davis Park, um, which is ADA equipment and um, ADA equipment and um, poured in place rubber at specifically Davis and Berwick um, for that 50,000 plus we have some um, poured in place rubber repairs we need to try to um, complete up at the South Street playground I'm not sure what they call that by name but up by the Arts Center South Street playground um, Islands. there's some um, deteriorating poured in place rubber walkway up there that needs to repair as well so that's specifically that, that 50,000, the ADA Parks and Rec line, that's specifically earmarked for those two, two three locations. Okay. So I learned a lot about how uh, this town has gone about developing a plan to guide us as we make ADA compliance a priority more and more. And I, you know, as I understand it, we've retained a consultant who conducted a survey, and that information will be added to the existing ADA transition draft. My question is, to what extent was the information that we have so far and, and documented so far, to what extent was that consulted to develop these priorities? I mean, specifically in the parks and playgrounds, they'd been identified that, the, that we had numerous, um, other than the most recently built playgrounds, there was very limited to no ADA specific equipment in them. So we knew that was, you know, just a, a process we needed to complete. We knew we needed to get with the time, so to speak, upgrade the older, um, the older playgrounds and, and, and install the ADA. Um, accessible equipment we just so you didn't have to consult it because you knew there was nothing there yeah we, okay. we knew there was a need it, it had been identified um, and we we're trying to trying to remedy it thank you and with regard to the other expenditures that have been recommended to what extent were was that data consulted to arrive at those priorities because we are a town that has many many ADA needs how were these priorities arrived upon well as you may know, that we did undertake a project at Sunset Lake for the playground walkways. And as part of that discussion and implementation with the engineering department, we also determined with facilities that we had some issues in the restroom. So we wanted to try and get those addressed because we were working on a project and we wanted to complete anything that could remain on that property that would be of concern. So that's where the Sunset Lake project was developed to make, to make sure that the, the restrooms are, the equipment is accessible in the restrooms, we need to make sure that access into the restrooms is accessible as well. So I connected with the facilities department during the project that was going on in the playground and said this is something that I think that we need to look at and Mr. McGordy absolutely agreed and that's where we developed that plan. Mm -hmm. The uh, town hall parking lot is something that I've been speaking with um, been about and he indicated there was a definite need. I think we all would agree there's a definite need for improvements to the town hall parking lot and accessibility wholesale accessibility is necessary not only for persons with disabilities but for everybody because the, the parking lots in very very poor condition and so that certainly is something when Ben mentioned it to me I said this is a worthy project for my, me to try and assist you with clearly because it there there are accessible needs in that parking lot. And I honestly, I don't want to see anyone get hurt. So we retained a consultant who conducted a survey and we added that information to the existing ADA transition draft. But none of this 
work is rooted in the guidance provided by that document? Well, the transition plan is being created. And yes, so it's, it's still, still in, in its, draft form. It's still in its draft form. It's being created. But we also have to identify not only thinking about the transition plan, but also current existing needs that are priorities too. And so all of these things are weighed equally. OK. I think I have my answer on that. The last comment that I have on this is that if I want to know which streets are slated for repavement, I can go to the town website and identify which ones are going to be repaved, or at least planned to be repaved. And if I want to know which roads are going to be targeted for water work, um, to be dug up for water repairs, I can find that information out. And I have a lot of information, for example, on what the fire headquarters, how that money is going to be spent. The information that I have on this comes from answers that were supplied through email, which I suppose is part of public record, but it's not accessible to the public in general. And I know that having these large buckets of ADA um, funding allows for a, me a measure of flexibility when some project is being worked on and there's an ADA component of that project. But it also <clears throat> reduces transparency for residents to know that we're relying on the guidance supplied by the people who have been hired to document what this town needs. And the danger that you run into with that has to do with permitting the town's priorities to guide how we use ADA funding rather than ADA needs guiding how we spend ADA funding. So this is a very small amount of money that we've actually spent a very long period of time talking about. It's uh, $190,000 total. And I don't think that it's enough. So I'm going to vote to support this. But it is my strong uh, conviction that this needs to be codified and made more transparent so that residents can know how the ADA funding is being spent and also how the, those decisions, those priorities were arrived upon. That's all. Thank you, Fla uh, Council Flaherty. And I know uh, you have another question, Council Maglio? I do. I have another mm -hmm. question and, and comment. Um, actually, I guess it's really just the transition plan. What are we transitioning from and to? Okay. So a community is required to provide a transition plan to identify and address um, areas of accessibility which are not compliant. Uh, the town has been endeavoring to do this for several years. We have, as has been stated, we have a draft transition plan. We are relying upon, we have been relying upon the services of uh, various consultants to uh, formulate plans of action and to identify those areas, such as the street scan project, which was done several years ago, which will be incorporated in uh, the ultimately the final draft of the transition plan. At present, we have another consultant going through doing uh, assessments of town holdings and buildings, which again, when that is complete, um, we will be sitting down with, with those folks to determine an order of priority and possible funding sources to make those improvements or corrections as necessary. Thank you. Um, and then just one comment. In terms of the town parking lot and you mentioning not wanting anyone to get hurt, I, I definitely um, concur with that. Um, but in terms of need, I look at there are other places in town with um, far more dangerous pathways that are completely inaccessible to anyone. For example, Allen Street in District 3, which is unpassable. Um, so I don't know that I would agree that the town parking lot is the uh, main priority. Thank you. Thank you, Council Maglio. Uh, I do have a few questions on this topic before we move on. So uh, thanks for the information and the update on the ADA transition plan. I know that is a central uh, piece of getting to where we want to be as far as ADA goes. Uh, there has been a lot of work done on that and um, I think we only have maybe two steps remaining. If, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere roughly there's 
I don't know, six or seven steps, I think, that are included uh, in that. So it sounds like progress has been made as far as uh, really getting across the line. We have some sp uh, very specific tasks that are ongoing coming up from a consultant standpoint, data collection, which will put us in a much better position to start to make decisions and courses of action that will get us to that completion. So thank you for those updates. Um, as far as the, the question on, I, I didn't realize that the parking lot, uh, the $80,000 that was required, are requested from the parking lot was part of the ADA uh, that you, uh, uh, excuse me, um, Director McGrath, that you would also be contributing an additional $30,000 to that project and that the full cost of the project is actually $110,000? Okay. What I want to know is um, the, the last evening we heard, and we've heard this a couple of different times, that that building, the old Thayer Library, was going to be transitioned into a, a, um, a regional dispatch center. And that part of that project, that there would be a bump out on the back of that building that would provide access from a handicap standpoint, an elevator, some handicap accessible bathrooms, which are great, uh, great use. Uh, and what I'm not clear on is that the actual timeline of that project. So maybe Chief of Staff, you could give us, because that would lead me to my next question. Sure, certainly. Um, so the town has applied through the State 911 program mm -hmm. for funding to support a regional emergency communication center. And working with a consultant have identified uh, the, the building at 2 JFK as the most appropriate location within the town to support that operation. The way that the grant funding works is it's, it's offered in phases. Phase one of the grant funding is to retain a project manager, an architect, and to complete the construction, all of which is fully funded through the grant, so there would be no expense incurred by the town. What that would do is it would convert that property uh, in order to, to properly house and meet the needs of that communication center. And so yes, that would include an elevator because there is not one currently in the building, ensuring that there is a handicapped accessible entrance to the building, uh, and potentially any, any work done in the immediate abutting area of the building. So where there is parking and part of the parking lot in that area, there is potential to utilize funding through the grant to mitigate the cost to do the entirety of the parking lot. And so that could certainly serve to reduce the $110,000 estimate, which is to redo the entire space. And so we expect to know hopefully later this month or in early June, whether or not we've been uh, awarded that phase of the grant. If we are, then that will reduce the town's response, the portion of the parking lot renovation that the town is responsible for and would ultimately as a result reduce the need to utilize capital funds for that, which would free up funding in either of the two lines that have been uh, appropriated to support that project. Presumably it would free up the ADA funding. Okay. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. Um, so, my question then would be for $110,000, and I don't know if this question, if you can answer this, uh, Director McGrath, or if, it, if it's the facilities director might be able to uh, answer this question. What exactly is the scope of the work? Is it just a resurfacing? Is it you pulling everything up? Are you fixing the drainage as well? Because we do know that that driveway, that, that that parking lot, it floods, excuse me, not floods, but it puddles. And with those puddles, they promote in freezing temperatures and thawing temperatures, heaving and whatnot. So I would think that if you're going to address the parking lot, and I also would suspect too that you would be, um, as that extensive explanation that was just provided by the Chief of Staff, that there'd be some configuration, reconfiguration of the parking lot and try to maximize uh, spaces, uh, more space if possible, but certainly be able to provide more uh, efficient locating or locations of the handicap parking uh, as, it's, as, as it pertains to the town hall access. So that being said, 
what does $110,000 pay for and what would actually it be doing right now? Or in, if, uh, my understanding, well, uh, before you answer that question, maybe this question is more appropriate as for it to be asked first. What's the time frame of working on this? So um, realistically, we could, um, we could get going shortly after, after approval of the funding. Um, and that is an excellent uh, point you raised, Mr. Chair, about uh, the drainage. Uh, we are aware of the drainage issues uh, in that location. And in fact, that's what is contributing to the severe deterioration of the right. asphalt. Uh, so we're in the process right now of doing some investigation. Um, there's a little bit of um, uh, missing information in terms of what we have for records for the actual drainage in the parking lot. Mm -hmm. So our first step is to sort of determine uh, where exactly all the drainage is rooting to. Um, there, there, is, um, there is a possibility that the, the catch basin structure sort of in central to that location is not connected to anything. It's simply just a dry well that's, that's leaching into the ground. Mm -hmm. um, so certainly our goal would be to, um, to finish those investigations and to make any repairs and any drainage connections that would be necessary first. Um, and then secondary to that, uh, the funding would be used to essentially excavate all the existing pavement, um, regrade, regrade the base material as much as possible to promote positive drainage to the drainage system. Um, and at the same time, also look at um, some, of the, some of the islands that, that are in the parking lot as well to see if they could be altered to, to help assist with the drainage okay. as well. Okay, and, and, and is the surface that's being replaced or, or that would be revitalized, I guess lack of a better term, is it just, are we looking just out here in the north side of the parking lot or are we looking out also the remainder of the parking lot that is the town hall property? So right now the scope of the work just includes the, the actual parking area that I guess is too... That would be the north? But exactly, behind. Right. Uh, behind me and not actually extending out into, okay. the, into the roadway or JFK Drive. Okay, so all of those tasks, I guess, that you had um, just enumerated, would $110,000 cover that? Between it should. The, it, it should. It should. That, it should. That includes the excavation, the replacement of connecting uh, any possible dry well to a drainage system. So, um, on, so, yes, and we would lean on in-house staff more than likely, uh, depending on what we find in the drainage investigations. Okay. And from an engineering perspective, if this construction project gets, uh, if, this, if this initiative is approved, um, and then there are other steps involved with the project manager, and, um, OPM, the, uh, excuse me, the, the engineering, a bidding process, or or is it, it won't be out to bid, it will be all in-house? Uh, so our intention right now is to actually do an in-house in design, finalize the design. On that design. building? Oh, I'm sorry, the building itself. Um, for, two, for two JFK, yes. the grant funding, that would all be publicly bid? Got it. Okay, thank you. So I guess my question then would be, is it practical for us to spend that amount of money? That, is there a likelihood that that is going to get part of that will be torn up? And will there be any other mitigation that will be done if, if and when that addition is being put onto that building as it pertains to the north parking lot area? My understanding is that the, the, um, the modifications that would be made to the building in the rear of the building would be uh, small enough in, in size that there would not be any major disruption to the, to the parking lot that would, that would necessitate delaying, delaying the project. And that would include any kind of staging area as well? It's probably too premature to, to say, but I think that the footprint of that project would be small enough that we could work and coordinate with that project to minimize any disruption to improvements that are made, and we could certainly work with that project to make sure that any disturbances that are done are, are um, you know, properly sort of tied in with, with, the, with the parking. Okay, well, thank you for that. And I know that uh, Councillor Maglio had made a mention about some sidewalks and streets in District 3. Um, I know that there's been some repair work done in District 2, particularly on Hollingsworth Avenue, uh, that has been addressed by patchwork. And when there were questions asked from neighbors and myself 
the answer was and, and from a concern of ADA accessibility because I do have a neighbor that walks has to walk on the street pushing his daughter in a wheelchair uh, to go out because the sidewalks were in such terrible shape. Would that kind of a standard also apply here if a patchwork was done for the time being until that building was completed? Uh, perhaps uh, Mr. Hell could, could, could weigh in a little, but my understanding is that the, the pavement is in such serious disrepair that it has to constantly be um, constantly be patched, which, which ties up, you know, some... We're talking the parking lot pavement. Correct. Okay. Correct. But as and far as the sidewalk areas that have been mentioned, is that, is that, suggest, is that solution right now that's being put in of just patching those sidewalks a satisfactory enough solution that it could also be applied at the same standard here for a short-term solution in this parking lot? I, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not sure I understand. So my, my point is this, there is ADA accessibility issues on the sidewalk, safety issues on the sidewalks of numerous streets in our town. And I've just mentioned a couple of them. And, though, and Hollingsworth Ave is an example. The res, as response to those, those concerns from neighbors was, the sidewalks, sidewalks were patched mm. with blacktop asphalt. And when the question was asked, is this satisfactory, it was, that we can't afford to redo these streets, and that's another topic to talk about, but, but the fact that public safety and accessibility of that street in particular was deemed to be acceptable with this patchwork that was done. Right. Okay, so my question is, citing that standard as an answer to the neighbor's questions, could you apply that same standard to this parking lot area for the short term, that is, patch it in the same manner you did with the sidewalks on various streets until that project at 2 JFK was completed? Yeah, you, you could patch it. Um, okay. there, there is a, there, the, the, it's sort of apples and oranges though, just in terms of, in terms of cost. And, you know, there, so, some of the sidewalk issues that you and mentioned. I, and are, I accept that, but it's, it's just the actual standard I'm curious about. Sure. Respectfully, Mr. Chairman, if Mr. Thompson has additional information relative to the question, I would ask that he just be allowed to provide it in sure. response. Sure, absolutely. So um, I think Allen Street and, and Hollingsworth Ave were the, were the two um, areas of, of, of concern that were mentioned. And, and unfortunately, um, there's just, we, we, we don't have funding to, to undertake the large scale, scale recon, reconstruction of those areas right now. Um, on, on Allen Street, it, there's a m major infrastructure um, issue that we're trying to address in terms of a retaining wall uh, that's retaining, essentially retaining the right of way. Um, that you know, right now our initial estimates are, are looking at somewhere on the order of two two million dollars to repair. Um, so the question becomes, does it make sense to make a temporary repair to the sidewalk that would ultimately have to be re-excavated uh, to repair the the, the retaining wall. Um, and in the c case of Hollingsworth Ave, again, um, to make a, a full reconstruction and, and, and um, of those sidewalks with edge treatments, and w we're talking somewhere on the order of a million to a million and a half dollars, depending on the different treatments. So um, is, I guess my point is sidewalk work is extremely, extremely expensive, and it's not something that um, we can undertake using things like the ADA funding um, or the operating, you know, our operating funds either. So, you know, it, there's a bigger conversation I'd be ha to be had, I think, moving forward on how to fund. I would like agree that. with that. I mean, we do. I mean, the simple nature of the capital plan is, you know, through the years is always, and in particular these most recent years, um, I, not most recent. I'm going to say going back 10 years that we have had a serious infrastructure issue with this community and the bill is coming due. And you're absolutely correct as far as the cost, the outlay for us to address everything. But, you know, in the absence of having all of that, it's just a fair and equitable question that I think is worthwhile a conversation. And I do appreciate your answers and I understand, um, you know, uh, to the point as far as apples and orange reference goes, um, 
but still they're both what's what is the common link is a public safety a accessibility issue sure so we do have to be mindful of that as we're moving forward and how we're prioritizing things so but thank you mr thompson i appreciate you taking that time to answer that question uh yeah. you've given me some more insight into all this and more to chew on absolutely and that i appreciate as thank well you. as the rest of the team here so uh Sounds like we have one more question. Council Maglio. Um, just a comment. I, when I mentioned Allen Street, um, I do want to say that I appreciated the meeting that we had last week where we talked a little bit about Allen Street and the plans for it. Um, I also appreciated the opportunity to write a support letter for the grant, and I know it's millions. And I definitely was not suggesting that um, the you know thirty or forty thousand left over from one project could solve the problems there. I was simply responding to the statement I think that uh, Director McGrath made that everyone would agree that the something to the effect of everyone would agree that the biggest need is the parking lot. And I just wanted to say that actually there are many different perspectives as to what the biggest needs are, one of them being Allen Street. So um, I just wanted to, to say that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yes, another? Uh, uh, excuse me, Councillor Flaherty, another comment? Thank you. Um, I, I looked, today was a really good day to look at the parking lot and determine its need because it rained and you can see the puddling and you can see places where it is crumpled. But as an order of magnitude, it pales compared to the condition of the high school parking lot. So my question regarding this item is how is this parking lot prioritized over the high school parking lot? So it's thinking about the high school parking lot, there is a large portion of that parking lot that received a temporary remediation measure uh, to carry us through uh, until we resume construction on the Peterson Pool Rink, which we anticipate is forthcoming in the very near future. So that entire section of the parking lot, if you're looking at the field to the left that directly abuts Carson Field, there, the drainage plans call for drainage in that area. So it doesn't, it doesn't make, it's not good spending to to expend funds to repave and redo that piece of the parking lot, knowing that it's going to get torn up for installation of the drainage and then going to have to undergo repaving again. So being mindful that there's work forthcoming in that area leads us to Town Hall. There were plans to redo the Town Hall parking lot two years ago, uh, and those funds were diverted elsewhere. And as a result, two years have passed where the conditions have worsened. It ends up costing potentially more money every time we have to implement a temporary fix, uh, which is not the solution. And we have Town Hall, as everybody knows, conducts a fair bit of business. We still have a large, a large percentage of our population who like to come here. They like to come here to pay their bills. They come here to file applications with the building and planning department. They come here to visit the town clerk for the vital services that are provided out of that office. There is an incredible amount of resident foot traffic and the town hall parking lot being in such a condition of disarray makes access to all more difficult. And that's a factor that has to be considered when identifying where the funds uh, can potentially be expended for use. So your argument is that it sees more foot traffic? Well, not my argument. Just the, the justification for prioritizing town hall was I don't know the last time significant and permanent repair work was done, and instead we have spent a large majority of, I don't know if, if Mr. Arsenault or, or Mr. McGurdy can speak to how long we've been patching or implementing these temporary solutions, but my understanding as it was explained to me is that only makes the problem worse. 
and that the condition of the town hall parking lot is in need of immediate repair because it's only going to worsen, it's going to get more expensive to fix, and it's going to become more dangerous for the high volume of individuals that rely on that parking lot to access town hall and the services that are offered here. I don't say any of that to disagree that the high school parking lot is also in need of attention, but in considering the current state of affairs in this location, it was identified as a more urgent need for substantive and significant repair work. And there's work coming to the high school parking lot as part of the um, pool and rink facility construction. We are. Yes. I mean, it's been a long time. Oh, I am well aware. <laughs> I am well aware. And not sure that that's appropriate topic for discussion this evening, where what we're talking about is capital. But there, the drainage plans require further excavation in the town hall, in the high school parking lot, and it doesn't make rational sense to perform more permanent work in that area, knowing it's going to have to be dug up. Yes, so you've put your finger on precisely the problem, is that the high school parking lot is just in a holding pattern until the pool can be addressed. And I don't have any idea how quickly that's going to happen. There is never, there's, I have no ability to measure the urgency with which that problem is considered. And to me, every single day, every single kid who comes to the parking lot and parks in this basically gravel area, that's their, that's what, that's what we've provided for them for their school. And at first it was like, well, obviously this is just part of some construction plan and it will not be forever. But now it feels like it's forever and we're prioritizing town hall parking lot over it and we only allocated, let's bring it back to the capital plan, $800,000, $850,000 for all 10 schools. So we've allocated basically one-tenth of that amount of money, just more than one-tenth, because it's really $110,000 to do the town hall parking lot. One, more than one-tenth of that sum is being allocated to this parking lot. So it is a question of priorities. And I, I know that the pool makes it harder to pin down when is the right time to do this, to do the high school parking lot. But I have to say that the decision to repave this parking lot is a priority that I, I'm not sure I can justify. That is all I have to say on that. Thank you, Council Flaherty. Okay, I think we're done with this topic of discussion. Thank you. Um, let's move on. I know we have a, a few more items just to give a heads up to the folks from Blue Hills uh, Regional High School. Thank you for attending. Uh, we just have another matter to attend before we get to you. Just one more question or one more topic in our capital plan and then we'll be getting right to you. So uh, I'd like to talk about this time, Chief of Staff, the Fire Department Headquarters Project. come back to my notebook <laughs> and right. uh, recognize with us this evening on this matter is Fire Chief uh, Jim O'Brien. I'll ask him to take a seat at a microphone. Uh, Russ Forsberg, Building Inspector again, and Mike McGurdy, Facilities Director. Um, this team of individuals have been actively engaged uh, with the OPM and the architect that was retained through previous uh, fire headquarter renovation appropriations. Uh, working to address significant, significant disrepair at fire headquarters uh, and try to figure out the best way to meet the needs of our, the men and women of the fire department while also staying within uh, a reasonable budget. Uh, and so, I, as was provided in some earlier notes, the fire chief uh, established a building committee of several representatives, including both firefighters and some of our own building experts, who worked with our OPM from Vertec and our architects from Context to begin the redesign. Uh, and 
where we are still in the design phase of that process, we are working now to value engineer the existing design plans to identify areas where we can reduce costs but still provide the same level of renovation uh, that is necessary to bring the fire station in line with the industry standards and again meet the needs of the men and women who work there. So we provided a high level description of the priorities for the project that would be funding, funded using this allocation. We've provided a, a budget, which is understanding a budget at this phase of where we are in the design process. And we've also provided the most recent draft plans for the first and second floor renovation, understanding that that is an evolving document as we continue to value engineer the project. And with that, I don't know if the chief has uh, anything, any words he'd like to say, or we can go uh, directly to questions. Well, first of all, I just want to say welcome, chief. It's good to see you. Thank you. Good okay. to be seen. And, and I want you to also know that we feel, uh, I know I speak for myself and I think I speak for, the, for my two associates here on the Ways and Means Committee. We've had the opportunity to tour and thank you for providing that opportunity to us. And we do also agree that it is an egregious situation that you find uh, yourself in and that we 100% support the fact that we need to do something with your building. Uh, this renovation as an outline, uh, having an opportunity just to kind of look through uh, the, the floor plans uh, and some of the questions that have been answered for us to this date, which I appreciate uh, everyone who's been involved in providing that information to us. Um, so I just wanted to let you know before um, we start going back and forth on questions uh, that this committee and myself uh, we are very much in favor of improving the situation in your headquarters building. So, the floor good is to, yours. Good to hear. Um, I don't know what I can say that hasn't already been said over and over for the past nine years <clears throat> that I've been chief. Um, as you mentioned, um, you guys have already toured the station. Um, Ms. Flaherty, I know you've been there a couple of times. Um, everybody on the current council, I believe, has had the chance to tour it in past councils as well. Um, there's no question <laughs> that that building is an embarrassment. Um, 91 years that building has gone untouched. If we were to compare it to a restaurant or a hotel that's in Braintree, I don't think the board would allow any type of business to be open for 91 years without renovation. We're talking about our firefighters here, um, four of which are female, and um, the accommodations in there are just barbaric. And um, I'm hoping that uh, you guys approve this and um, we can move on in the design phase and get this done. And very I'm good. Very good. Able to answer any questions you might have. Great. So the basis of my questions are going to be, and I think it was a good term that was already used, was a description of where we are with the project right now and the value, the importance of the value engineering in order to to um, deliver on the value, to deliver on the upgrades that are necessary, absolutely necessary, mm -hmm. to do your job and to safely uh, accommodate. Uh, your firefighters on their ships. Uh, and with the backdrop, we find ourselves in a very, very difficult financial situation as far as our capital needs go and our overall infrastructure needs go. And I think there's a priority is your building. How we get that done and how those numbers are applied, I think, is really where the questions are that remain right now. So um, I believe that we'll probably make some significant progress this evening with the question and answering. So I'm going to, I'm going to save my questions. I'm going to provide the opportunity to my fellow uh, committee members to ask any questions they may have first. And I'm going to start with Council Flaherty. Thank you. Um, so as I toured through the fire headquarters, I noted many, many needs. And I just want to know which needs 
the fire headquarters has that this plan will address and which needs it will, will still remain once this is you know, executed and finalized. So um, I can kind of go through a list or you can just tell me. Well, um, I would say to start, um, as you unfortunately saw with your own eyes, um, the living accommodations in there are, um, again, barbaric. Uh, right now, we have 13 firefighters stationed there. We have six admin, including myself and our financial coordinator. Our side of the building, even though it's wood paneled and shag carpeted, is probably 10 times better condition than the fire suppression side. And to me, that's the important side that uh, we need to focus on. Uh, our men and women who protect our town are there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And those doors have never closed since 1931. I don't know of any other building in this town that's like it, um, that has lacked the attention over the past I've been there 34 years, and that building has just continually gotten worse, uh, as you saw. So again, the, the living accommodations is a priority. What we will gain in addition to that, uh, if I could describe the living accommodations, just so we're all on, on board here. Um, there are 13 firefighters. There are eight bedrooms, uh, the majority of which are uh, six by eight or six by seven in size. Um, for years, most of those accommodated two firefighters. If you can imagine two six-foot-plus, 200-pound men at the time um, in the middle of the night trying to you know, get their gear on and get down to a truck uh, was a little uh, comical, to say the least. We have one bedroom that's called a dormitory that houses four firefighters, which also houses um, up to 20 lockers in there as well, personal lockers. It's, it's way past its prime, as you saw. Um, what we will gain in addition to that is a decon room, which, is, uh, which will be on the apparatus floor as we back in behind engine one. It now serves as a union room, um, which basically is just collected junk over the years. Um, we will get an expanded, a much needed expanded gear room, which as you saw is kind of spread out throughout the first floor of, of the building. Uh, some gear is uh, in the apparatus floor, some gear is uh, in the old jail cells where the police station uh, housed, uh, I'm not gonna call them inmates, just uh, misbehaved people. Um, where the gym is now, our firefighters, including myself, did a little bit of work there in the early 90s uh, to take down the existing cells and uh, build that gym. And uh, it's kind of a, a source of pride for us. Uh, it was updated 2014 with new equipment. And um, again, it, it, it may be the nicest part of that entire building, which is sad to say. With the addition that's going on there, the gym will be expanded <clears throat> and um, the existing gym will be used in addition to um, the gear room, which will be hard to describe for me unless you're seeing it uh, in person. But um, if you, the existing gear room now, the wall will be torn down and expanded into one giant gear room. So everybody uh, has to go to one room. Uh, there'll also be a bathroom uh, clean up room, if you want to call it that, uh, in that area. So uh, anybody that's exposed to um, any fluids from a car, um, bus, anything like that, blood, uh, there'll be a shower as well in there. I apologize. That's all right. <coughs> um, again, much, much needed. Uh, there are no bathrooms on the first floor except for dispatch and... Um, with the potential emergence of the communication center, that dispatch area will be vacant. So that bathroom will be used as a public handicapped accessible bathroom, uh, which we don't have right now. Uh, new HVAC, which 
anybody that's been in that building will tell you that the air quality is awful. It's just terrible. Um, we're looking forward to that. We're looking forward to everybody. We will go from eight rooms, eight bedrooms, excuse me, to 13, which would give everybody um, their own quarters, which in this day and age, I think we can all agree is much needed, uh, especially when you have female firefighters. I think it's an embarrassment to them, the condition of that building, and uh, it's very tough to accommodate um, what we need to accommodate in this day and age. I think right now that building, again, it was built in 1931. We're still in 1931 in that building. And my hope is that this uh, renovation will bring us into the 21st century and uh, hopefully hold up for another 30, 40 years. What it won't address is the apparatus floor uh, there is a little bit of work going to be done to the apparatus floor, but the the general floor itself, I believe, is not in the plans. Correct, Mike? It is correct. Is not in the plans. That needs to be addressed somewhat in the near future. Um, the facade of the building, front, rear, sides, um, I don't believe is included in that. And facilities, uh, I must say, before I go on, has done unbelievable work so far in getting us ready to transfer from headquarters to the uh, Galvin House um, over and above the work they've done there and um, what they're going to do in the future. It's very much appreciated. And as Nicole mentioned, uh, value engineering, um, ha we were at a price tag of $14.5 million, and it's, it's been reduced to eleven five. So there has been some substantial um, Again, value engineering that's been done to reduce the cost of this renovation. That's all I have for you. Thank you. Okay, so thank you for that. Um, your living accommodations will be greatly improved, and that is um, wonderful to hear. And I'm so one of my questions on that is whether there will be furnishings that will be purchased new once the new accommodations are built? Like God, I hope beds. so. Sorry? I, I said, God, I hope so. The stuff that's in there now is, uh, again, it's deplorable. I, so I hope so too, but is there money for it? Is, the, is, is it budgeted for? Right now, no. I actually are included uh, within the... Um, the budget allocated the 11 and a half million. Okay. It does include furnishings, it includes new equipment for the kitchen uh, and other items that will go into the new. Okay, um, so there w that was one of my questions. New equipment for the kitchen will be included. Um, And there's going to be an expanded gym. Will there be additional gym equipment now that you have more space? That's the goal. Uh, again, we'd have to see what we have at the end. The equipment we have right now, again, is eight years old at, at best. It's still in pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to uh, continue to use that, but also add to it. Okay. And so the uh, heating and ventilation will be solved? Correct. Okay, and you're gonna have a new roof? Correct. So that will be solved. And then um, the plumbing, will that be solved? Yes. The plumbing will be solved? Yes. Good. Yes. Um, and how about electrical? Everything, soup to nuts, whole system. Electrical will be totally new. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, so then your remaining needs will be the apparatus floor. Can you describe, like, to me, who's not a firefighter, what's on the apparatus floor? So the apparatus floor houses, there's four overhead doors. Uh, if you look at the um, front facade of the building, um, engine one, engine four, ladder two are there, plus uh, car two, which is the deputy's vehicle. Um, as you saw in the back of those engines, you saw a, a pile of junk. You see old hose, you see a couple of boats that we can't even use uh, in fresh water. 
um, trash barrels, old gear, whatever you saw in there has been collected there and we have nowhere to put it. So I I'm hoping that in the future when the apparatus floor is addressed that there could potentially be a bump out in the back um, that would address these needs, space needs. Okay, so the remaining needs are, would be space needs then, largely. Yes. Storage, not so much um, living quarters because you'll have enough room for the people, but all mm -hmm. the gear that you need and the apparatus that you use to take care of the gear and so on and so forth. Um, so space needs will remain to be addressed. The facade has, will not be addressed. Um, and then the apparatus floor, when you say that that is a need that should be addressed, it sounded like you had too many things there, which is really a space need. But what's on the, you know, are you talking about digging up the apparatus floor and replacing it? Or is there something else you mean? I'm going to be a quarterback and hand the ball off to Mike McGurdy on this one. Yes, thank you. Um, one of the problems they have in that uh, uh, area is the drainage. Uh, it has to be replaced. We don't know the complete extent of it. Uh, we will be scoping it out uh, through the town's resources uh, as part of this uh, final plan that they're putting together. Uh, but the drainage that's existing there right now is inadequate, and uh, some of the drains we're really not sure where they're hooked up to. Uh, they're embedded in concrete, so we won't know that till we get, uh, get them scoped, which we're hoping to get done uh, possibly next week to have it scheduled. So you have to get an estimate or is to get the drainage scoped and then you can know whether that, that can be included in this project? That is correct. We're hoping that that will be part of it. Uh, Mr. Forsberg and I have been over there. He uh, may be able to speak on that as well. Okay. And so when you look at the... Is there, are there needs that you, Mr. McGordy, would, do, would like to add it? To the conversation, the needs that will remain once this project is completed. Sure, there's there's you know exhaust equipment that could be upgraded within the uh, vehicle storage area. Uh, what they have there now works, but to bring it up to speed, to state of the art, that would all have to be upgraded. So there's a an extensive amount of cost, additional cost to upgrade that portion of the building. It's operable now, but uh, maybe. Um, within a year or two, uh, at some point, they could address those needs as well. Uh, if I could add to that, it's, it's a Plymo vent system, which is, I think I showed you guys, it's attached to the exhaust mm -hmm. uh, when the truck's back in. The back step will get off and attach the Plymo vent to the exhaust. That prevents the fumes from going upstairs. Uh, for the most part, there's still some fumes that get up there. When the trucks are called out and they're pulled away, the Plymo vent goes all the way to the front of the uh, bay door and disconnects from the exhaust. Right now, those Plymo vents are held together by towels, duct tape, and uh, bungee cords. So that is an absolute necessity that those are replaced. Okay. Um, on the list, the total project budget update from April 26th. There's a soft cost contingency that's identified as $50,000 at the very bottom. And I'm wondering what you anticipate as soft costs that might be covered by that. Um, I would say, you know, hazmat remediation um, would probably be, maybe take up the bulk of that if it does. But there's a lot of unknowns in that building. Um, there was a shooting range in there. Yep. And, you know, in 19, I believe it was 1975. I know 1972 was mentioned earlier, but our records have 1975. I, I was not there at that time, by the way. Um, in that shooting range, um, talking to the, the guys that are now retired that were there that did the work, they basically slapped paneling over what was existing. So there's definitely casings in the wall. And as you know, this, that contains lead. So that would need remediation for sure. Um, 
the windows, uh, most of the windows are encased in lead. Uh, there's right. asbestos um, underlayment under the carpets. There's asbestos, uh, horsehair plaster contains asbestos. There's mold in the attic that needs remediation. So there's, uh, I'm assuming that would take up pretty much all of that 50,000, if not more. Um, if you handled the drainage on the apparatus floor and had to dig up the floor, would there be uh, remediation needed there as well because of the engines having been parked there for so long? I, I would say yes. Uh, there's plenty of uh, the oil water separators that are in there would need to the, be replaced. The plan does include a new uh, oil gas separator that will be installed out back in the building that we checked into that. It's the drainage piping that exists now that is suspect. Um, it, once we get into it, we'll know better. Um, there, sh there may be enough money in the cost to do some repair work to it, um, but we'll get a better idea of what the extent of the work needed will be after we scope the pipes. Okay. Um, I notice on the list that there's no expense for the planning board peer review. Is that because it's going to be conducted by the town and so we won't charge ourselves? Or is that because there will not be a planning board peer review? So I think that that's, it's project specific. And so um, it hasn't been determined whether or not there's going to be a peer review. But presumably where it's a town project, we wouldn't, we wouldn't pay ourselves from one pocket to the other. So there wouldn't be a cost associated. Okay. Um, that's a lot for me to chew on. I'm going to, um, what do we say, yield the floor? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Council Maglio, questions? Yes, thank you. Um, so I visited the headquarters. We've talked a lot about the great need. I have to just say on the record, I was shocked and appalled at the condition of it and the question I have that I don't think can be answered easily or tonight or maybe even by anyone here is how you mentioned the doors have been open since 1931. It's almost a hundred years. In nine years, it'll be a hundred years. And I don't understand how it takes that long to get significant upgrades um, and to launch a capital plan uh, to, to raise funds to rebuild a fire station. I'm just um, stymied by that. So I just wanted to put that out there. Question, I have just a, one general question. Um, you mentioned that at one point it was about 14 million and then there was some value added and some costs were taken out. But then there is a, a pretty significant list of the kinds of things that are not included. I have no idea of the scope of costs of those things, but was that part of the value added? Were any of these things that you mentioned, the apparatus for the facade, the space needs, the bump out, those kinds of things, were any of those in the plan, but they were taken out? Yes. Um, one of them, probably the major one, was the um, rare addition in the back of the building, um, which would have uh, given us some pretty significant storage space, as uh, we addressed earlier. Um, also would have provided uh, three vehicle spots, Yes, I believe. Correct. Um, understanding we're tight with money, I totally understand that. Um, this was part of the value engineering. We're still getting the addition bumped out onto Tenney Road, um, which will provide, expand the fire suppression side. It, they'll basically have 75% of the second floor and the admin will have the other 25, 30%. I don't know the actual percentage, but I believe it's about that. Thank you. Um, I guess my, my comment in response to that is, if it's something that we know we need now and it's something that we know we're going to, we have to invest in, mm -hmm. I am confused and concerned that it was actually removed. I understand there was a need to bring the price tag down, mm -hmm. um, but this is a project that we're, that we already know it's not enough. And so I think that my interest is in spending a little more time focused on that and um, figuring that out, I guess. Well, I, I think we can, you know, with the addition um, that's going on there uh, on the side of the building on Tenney Road, 
um, that does address some of our needs. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned earlier, in the future, when we address the apparatus floor issues, if we bump out the apparatus floor then, that will correct the omission of that second addition here. So I think in order for us to get where we need to be right now, or actually 30 years ago, um, we don't necessarily need that addition right this second. Um, the focus, the main focus is the second floor and, um, you know, part of the, uh, say half of the first floor with the uh, bunker gear room and the decon room and things like that. Thank you. That's helpful. I would just caution that given that it's been 90 years since a significant upgrade, um, not doing it all now seems a little bit risky. Well, I'll take what I can get right now. I'll be honest with gotcha. you. Gotcha. Um, I okay. start my 10th year as chief next week, and I've been working on this almost every week mm -hmm. since then. So three mm -hmm. feasibility studies later, we're finally in a design phase, and uh, I can tell you that the morale is low over there, and I, I want to thank the firefighters for never making a big issue or as big an issue as they could have out of this. I think it's well-deserved for them and for those that protect our community, and um, I can't wait to get going on it. I would agree. Thank you. You're welcome. All set? Thank you, Councillor. Okay. Uh, I do have a few questions. So, let's see, where do I start? All right, we'll look at, the uh, first thing I'm looking at here is the total project budget, the draft dated 426.22. It's giving us a total appropriation request of $11.5 million. Um, <clears throat> we have a, uh, a breakout of some various informations, uh, information, excuse me, uh, the construction base bid of 9.9 .9 million is uh, my understanding is is going to be is going to be associated to the actual construction work itself. Is that correct? Yes. Do you have yes? Yes, it is. Okay, terrific. Thank you. And the remaining the difference between uh, the 11.5 and the almost 10 million then would be for Outfitting? That would be correct. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, soft costs, there's a description, a number of lines here that say amendment number one through amendment number eight. Can you give me an idea of what is in these amendments? So that, those, uh, I believe, were increase in payments to the architect to get us through the design portion to the state. So those are payments to the architect? I, I believe that's correct. Okay, so would someone be able to give us an answer on that if you don't have it tonight? Mr. But Forsberg has just confirmed those are amendments made to the contract with context to the architect to okay. fund the design services today. Okay, great. Thank you. In and addition, go ahead. In addition to that, uh, you have to also remember that um, there are other um, design professionals involved with this that those uh, amendments also will be funding. Um, uh, things such as structural uh, review, uh, soil engineering, analysis. More engineering, more exactly. engineering related. Correct. And on average, you know, you have to build in a base uh, percentage of some 10% of your project budget to, um, to address the issue of uh, professional design services, not only in the production of drawings, but in the administration of the plans uh, during construction. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, so is there an engineer already on this project? Uh, yes, uh, through the context of architecture, there is a uh, engineering in-house engineering consultant that has been brought on to uh, do certain analysis of the existing structure and the implications of the addition to uh, that existing structure. Great, thank you. I will have a couple of questions on the engineering just um, as I as I walk through this. Uh, let's see, the OPM, the OPM has been hired, correct? Yes. At Vertex, right? Yes. Vertex, okay. So a couple questions on that. Um, have they already reviewed what you have for plans and the associated costs? 
they generated the, the cost oh, and the okay. budget came directly Even from better. the tax. Okay, and those numbers then, so the other way around, and they've been validated by the engineers and the architects? Correct. Okay. Um, how much money has been spent on this project to date? We provided that. Bear with me one moment. I think we provided that in response to a question from President Baraka. Yeah. I'll, if you can come back to that, I'll find no, out. No worries. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and do we have a, a project timeline of when there is an end date, an agreed upon end date? It's widely held that the project in question uh, will run somewhere in the order of 15 months from the initial uh, start to completion. Okay. 15 months. Okay. And the start date was or is? Um, it's, it's projected, right, the last projection that I saw was uh, November. November is what? The start of the start. Start the date. The start of construction. Start date. Okay, thank you. November 22. Okay, I think I did see a, that November 22 numbers uh, reference somewhere in the documentation. Thank you. Okay, 15 months. Um, and does the OPM, I mean, I know the, the OPM is being paid uh, 615, almost 616, uh, excuse me, $616,000. Uh, and does that OPM, are they contracted through the agreed upon end date? Or do they stay on until this project, that cost represents till completion of the project regardless if it goes beyond the 15 months? I believe they committed to the project as opposed to the actual end date. Can you so, confirm that for me? Yes. That's Thank you. We can, we can certainly provide, and I don't want to dig through and, and spend time, Great. but I can, I can provide copies of the contracts that have been executed with both Vertex and Context and also confirm the dollar value expended to date. Thank you. Um, okay. That, there's a few questions related with that I'll pass uh, on. Um, so, does the OPM also pick up the costs of uh, anything to do with construction, permitting, fees, anything of that nature? The OPM is contracted to strictly just oversee the project? Right. The OPM would work in conjunction with both the town and the architect and the design team, I should suggest. Uh, to uh, monitor and to see through the end of the project. But the OPM, and I know in some situations an OPM would take on that responsibility as part of an incentive, but not in this case. They're not no. going to be responsible for paying any kind of cost related to the project. No. Just provide a service. Correct. Great. Thank you. It, it will be the responsibility of the uh, general contractor uh, in terms of permitting, but again, given this is a town project, traditionally those fees are waived. Great. Thank you. And the general contractor is still a question that, that's a bid process. Is that correct? That, yes. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, so are the, uh, are the construction or more so mechanical engineering, uh, electrical and plumbing, MEP costs, um, are, uh, does that also include the structural and the civil engineering for this project? Yes. And, and is that what we're seeing? My screen went out. Is that what we are seeing as part of the 9.9 .9 million? Correct. All of that will be rolled up into that? Yes. Okay. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, let's see. So I know in looking at, um, there was a mention by Mr. McGurdy talking about, and also by the chief about, you know, we don't know what we have yet, right, until we start to peel back some of the things, be it being a very old building. Um, and so we still have to put a number on. Uh, 
the mitigation for asbestos, potential asbestos mitigations, potential or likelihood of lead uh, mitigation. Um, and another concern, I guess, would be it being an old building. From an HVAC perspective and all of your, your, your MEP uh, requirements and your design, you're putting in a lot of ducts, you're putting in new electrical work, you're putting in new plumbing. Do you, does your architect have full insight into the entire building structure itself so that when you take a wall down, you're not going to run into maybe a concrete wall, you're not going to run into a support beam where you wanted to put in duct work or you wanted to run in electrical services or plumbing through. Is there still a likelihood that that is a potential or has that been fully mitigated? I, uh, in, in discussions with the architect and engineers uh, involved with the project, uh, it, it appears as though the building has been pretty thoroughly vetted in terms of um, it, its structural configuration. Mm -hmm. Now, it should be noted as part of the um, uh, value engineering, um, the town has come up with uh, an alternative from the original proposal relative to the mechanical systems, mm -hmm. much not unlike what was done here at Town Hall, by where we could, you know, again, potentially experience some cost savings and, and the like. Uh, Mr. McGurdy was instrumental in identifying certain portions of the building that, again, could serve that purpose instead of <coughs> perhaps being what is most conventionally done nowadays, put it all, everything on the roof. Right. Okay. Terrific. Well, and that leads me then to another question as far as the roof. So, um, uh, so have there been engineering uh, stress tests, I'm not quite sure what the terminology is, that the placement of your, uh, your transformers, your generators for your HVAC, et cetera, generally speaking, they're up in the, the attic. And so, is that equipment you've already validated? That equipment can be handled. The weight can yes. be handled within within the building itself. Yes, and the the generator that we right. use right now is actually outside the back of the building on okay. the pavement. So that'll handle all of your your HVAC. Yeah, they're um, going to go on the roof of the addition, I believe. Uh, actually, actually, uh, a lot of that equipment uh, will be located in the attic space, similar as uh, Mr. Forsberg has mentioned that yeah. we did here at Town Hall. There will be some uh, additional um, structural design work for platforming, but they have uh, st heavy steel beams and trusses in the attic. So I'm sure from our initial uh, review that uh, there will be more than adequate enough structural um, components to hold the equipment that's going to be needed. Great. Okay. And so you, but at this point, you can't, I mean, understandably so, you cannot specifically finalize exactly every little requirement of what you're going to be able to do there. Well, until you get there, essentially. I provided uh, Vertex and Context with the original blueprints from yeah, 19, you had those. 19th, yeah. Wow. <laughs> from 1930 when they, you know, did them. Yep. Um, they seem to think everything's on the up and up. They have every little nook and cranny accounted for. Great. So if you can't go by the original blueprints, I guess we're in trouble. Okay, thank you. That, that's and very Considering helpful. the fact that nothing's ever been done to the building, everything should be status quo. Right, okay, thank you. Okay. And Mr. Chairman, if I could, yes. if I could add, um, two uh, concerns relative to structural adequacy of the existing framework. Um, you have to understand that the east side addition, which is what we're talking about, uh, being constructed at this point will be an independent structure from the existing uh, fire station. It will be uh, abutted to it, but it will be in fact its own structural skeleton and elements, so there will be no additional loading or weight added to the fire station as a result of the addition. Um, and to uh, Councilor Maglio's concern relative to a possible bump out later on, the rear addition was actually going to be, uh, this was designed, I should suggest, as an independent structure so that if, in fact, uh, funding is found to go forward with it, as the chief has alluded to, mm -hmm. um, that could be added at any time without disruption to the infrastructure of the station as modified in this proposal. Great. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I just want to yes. apologize. I have to step out momentarily. Certainly. So I'll ask Director Spellman to take my place. And Absolutely. Back shortly. Thank you for your time Thank and you. everything this evening. Um, all right. Speaking... Well, before I go to the addition on the building, so just staying within the existing building, um, 
I see that an elevator is going to be added, which is great. And it's my understanding that you need a, if I get the correction, it, it's a three-phase electrical service for an elevator? Yes. And is that already in place in that building? No. So you would have to add a three-phase electrical service? Correct. And is that part of your cost estimates already that's been presented to us? Yes. It has. Okay. And what, uh, so is that part of the 9.9 .9 million? Yes. Okay. How much is that? The elevator? For, for the introduction of that service. My understanding is it's, it may be as a million and a half dollars. I, I honestly don't have a figure on that. I'd have to refer back to our design team on that one. All right. That'd be interesting to know. Um, with that, I'd also know, is there on the utility pole, the belled utility pole outside that provides electrical service to the building, my understanding is that that pole would also have to be up, like, upgraded in order to be able to provide that three-phase service to the building itself and that it would have to more than likely be buried through duct work, et cetera, into the ground from a standard. Is there something you can comment on that? Well, portion of the, the electrical room at present is uh, located in the, uh, I'll say, partial basement in the right rear corner right. of fire headquarters. And I do know it's going to be in front now. That's correct. It's right. going to be uh, readily accessible, a vast improvement. I mean, if there's right. one area of the building that really needs it, it's the electrical room. Um, invariably, that's going to be, in part, brought underground to that location. So I can't speak to the... Uh, adequacy of the transformer that's on the pole immediately adjoining the property, but uh, at least a portion of that electrical service upgrade, including uh, necessary electrical upgrades for the elevator system, will be brought underground through conduit. Sure. Okay. Would you be able to provide us some clarity on that? Uh, I, I can absolutely speak with Beld about that. Yeah, yes. I, I'd be interested. It, it's just a cost I want to make sure that we're all, you know, uh, have that expectation. The uh, Okay, and the addition to the building itself, I mean, excuse me, the, the building addition on the east side of the building. So you, is that going to replace that one-story garage you have there now, or is... Yes. Yes, that, it's going to okay. be torn down and built back up. Great, okay. So I did note that there is zero dollars for soil testing. Was there a reason why, with the excavation work being done, um, I'm assuming excavation work would need to be done for a foundation on that addition, that bump out. Um, due to the nature of its use, the site's use, and the number of years and whatnot, was there a decision made that soil testing was not required? Not to my knowledge, no. Okay. So I did note that that is, is a blank on the cost estimate. So if we could get some information just on that as well. Uh, as, I, as we said, I just again want to pause to, to, to say that, you know, these are, we ask a lot of questions. I want this project done, really do, we do. But we have to make sure with, again, the, the environment that we're operating in, in very, very tight constraints, that, you know, we're really doing the best we can. And from what I'm hearing so far, it sounds like you're doing a very good job of that. Um, but in some cases, couple of sets of eyes looking at different things, particularly when it comes to complex projects like this. Um, and our, of course, our responsibilities of, of being the keeper of the pocketbook, if you will, uh, for approving uh, allocations, it, it's, it gives us that greater level of comfort. So we do appreciate your time and your patience in providing and your effort in providing us with these uh, additional pieces of information. Um, Okay, uh, fire suppression. So fire suppression, I think I heard you say, Chief, that the fire suppression doors haven't worked. The overhead doors? What was it? I, did, maybe I misunderstood the comment. I heard you say something about fire suppression, and then soon, or if not in the same sentence, I heard something about the doors haven't been open, or maybe you stated since the doors have been open in 31? No, I think the comment I made that the, our doors, quote unquote, have been open since 1931. Okay, thank you. Because the fire suppression, what is that? Is that a dry or a wet system or what? It would be a combination. No, a combination. Correct. Right. And what is current? Hmm? What is the current? Do you have a water, a wet suppression system currently? No, there's no sprinklers in the building at present. Okay. 
Would there be, and I guess this would be a question for you, Mr. Forsberg, with the introduction of the wet fire suppression system, is there going to be a need for the delivery or an, ex an expansion of the uh, water lines to the building in order to accommodate the need or requirements of, the, of a wet fire suppression system? I think you'd have to first do a flow test uh, mm -hmm. immediately outside at the closest hydrant to determine what the uh, static pressure is right. and then make a determination from there as to whether or not the adequacy of the existing service size is going to support that. You have to remember now when you're sizing a sprinkler system, it's only sized for one out of every 10 heads to actually activate at any given time. So it doesn't okay. draw tremendous amounts of additional water requirements for that system to be put in place. But it is a due diligence step that you would need to take to ensure that you have the adequate um, infrastructure to deliver on the expectation of what that system will be able to do and perform. Oh, absolutely. Okay. So at this point, that's still an open question, mm -hmm. would you say? Yes. Okay. Um, and at what, and from your experiences, at what point of the project would that kind of stuff begin to have a reliable rough order of magnitude for a cost? That would be essentially uh, during the initial phase, which would be uh, demolition, uh, interior demolition, and a ass site assessment of, uh, of the existing um, systems. Okay. All right. Thank you. That, this is very helpful. I appreciate your, your, your taking this time again, as I said. Um, I, I think right now you've given me some, uh, some great updates. This, again, I appreciate the documentation. I'd really look forward. I think we need time to chew on this just a little bit. Um, so, absolutely. Thank you. From my own perspective, uh, I'd like to get some just additional information as we talked about. Um, it seems like you readily you have it, and, and we'll be able to be able to see that information. Um, I don't want to drag this out, really. I, we just we just again, as I cited before, there's two main reasons we're here this evening. First and foremost, we need to address that building for you, Chief for the firefighters. We absolutely have to do that. Number two, you can understand this because uh, you've gone through this drill a number of years when you do capital and you know, you know the justification process and uh, lining up against and competing with other needs, not only in your department but with other departments as well. And um, uh, I don't think I'm going to have any issues at this particular point with, as while I have the floor, uh, with the um, fire engine. Uh, the pumper. Um, I have noted that you do have, uh, you've got an outlay over the next till 26, fiscal year 26, of the different equipment that you've, you're anticipating you're going to need to replace the major equipment. So, um, uh, so I'm going to yield the floor at this point. There are a couple of more questions that I want to be at by, the, by my fellow committee members. So I'm going to recognize uh, Councillor Flaherty. Thank you. Um, so as I've listened to your answers to uh, the other counselors' questions, two thoughts occurred to me. One is that in the case of South Middle School, it was judged to be cheaper to tear the thing down and rebuild rather than renovate what's in place because you got to bring it up to code, you have to be concerned about hazardous material remediation and so forth. Now in the case of the fire headquarters, we're not going that route for a host of reasons that I'm not going to discuss tonight. That's been decided. We're going to do the, um, the renovation. So my question is, it's an old building, and I need to know what are the risks um, that it, life's not perfect. Things crop up. You guys are the ones who are much more um, experienced in this kind of work. So wh what are the things that uh, that might really challenge the $50,000 that are allocated for soft cost contingencies? Again, I, I think it's all remediation of hazardous materials. Because mm -hmm. there are soft costs for construction. Uh, there's a construction contingency, which is $460,000. I think that would be separate from uh, any remediation. So I, I again, uh, Mr. Forsberg or Mr. McGurdy could probably answer that better than me, but knowing that building the way I do and knowing what it contains, that's my opinion of where that $50,000 would be spent. 
What I'm getting at is, is $50,000 enough? I certainly hope so. <laughs> I don't know. But you never know, but I'm looking for a, um, either perhaps Mr. Forsberg or Mr. Sure. McGurdy could elaborate. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when you're doing any kind of an estimate, you have to have an end game as to where you're going. I mean, we could have put in 200000 and that would obviously just elevate the cost of the project in general. Um, we took a number that we felt that um, looking at the asbestos reports that we had had done on the building, and uh, we know we have it in the flooring, there is caulking in some of the windows, that to remove that prior to demolition as a soft cost, you know, it may run somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, 15 to 25,000, and then you have hidden costs because as the chief has said, as you open up walls, it's difficult to tell what kind of coverings you will have on the, on the heating lines and so forth. But we're not anticipating a lot of that on the heating lines because the heating system was upgraded and that is something that uh, is going to remain part of the uh, new project, the heating uh, system itself, not the cooling or the uh, air handlers. That's gonna be all upgraded and new. Okay. and. Um Mr. Forsberg, you're confident that the building can be brought up to code for the cost that's identified here? I am. Okay. And Mr. McGurdy, you agree with Chief O'Brien that the main risk has to do with hazardous material re remediation? Yes. Okay. Um, the last question that I have, and I do thank you for your time, but I will not soak up more of it thanking you. Um, I am in charge. I have one vote to determine whether to allocate the money, which I certainly would like to do. Um, but I need to know for the residents who is in charge of determining that or ensuring that this project is on time and completed according to specs and uh, on budget. Well, I think that would be the OPM and that would be built into the bid um, and the contract in general. And um, as Mr. Forsberg stated, uh, 15 months is what we're looking for, and hopefully that will be included in the whole process. Okay. So the o OPM is in place to be able to ensure that, and they are the authority in making that happen. Yes. They're the babysitter, so to speak. All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate You're welcome. all your answers. Thank you, Council Clare. One more opportunity. You're good to go? All right. Thank you. Okay, so um, are there any questions pertaining to any of the other items on the general fund capital plan that either uh, of the members may have? Um, as I mentioned also, there was the uh, fire uh, pumper truck. So are there any questions in that area? Good? Good, okay, thank you. So what we're going to do, I think, is we're gonna take a motion to table this. Um, we would like to have you back here sh very soon with those answers uh, to some of those questions that we asked. And I think we're going to be in a place that uh, we all want to be in. So again, thank you all for your time, for your patience, for the information, your efforts that you put in. Uh, we're very fortunate to have you guys working on this project. You know, your, your, your valuable assets to the town. And of course, we know the valuable a the asset that the fire department is. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay. And so, we're going to need to uh, take a motion to table. Your motion will be motion to table council orders number 22006 and 22007 until Wednesday, May 11th, 2022, at 6 p.m. Is there a motion to approve that motion? Do we have a motion? <clears throat> so moved. We have the motion. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. That would be for uh, both 007 and 006? Is that your intent? You want that to table both? That is the intention. Both. both. That's for both. That's 2020, 006, and 07. Thank you. Okay. We're done with that business then for the evening. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you bet. You. Thank, Thank you. you.
Okay, you got it. Uh, we now have to open up, uh, or actually, do we need to table this? Uh, is there any tabling of the No, you the just capital? tabled it. You tabled okay, so it. there's nothing more with the capital. Now we can move forward with the bringing out, uh, yeah, opening now, up the now public Now you're going to be going on to Blue Hills Regional High School, Correct. item number 22025. Very good. Okay. Okay, there we go. Uh, Motion to take off the table, order 22025. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Very good. Okay. So we now uh, have an open hearing on the FY 2023 operating budget. And this evening we will be, um, we have before us the Blue Hills Regional High School represent, rep representatives. Um, we have, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I recognize one individual, former Braintree employee and always a, 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 always a Braintree guy, uh, Eric Erskine. And he is the representative from the Blue Hills Regional School Committee for Braintree. Thanks, you just took half my uh, work away. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Mr. Casey, and Mr. Spellman. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jill Rosendi, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Jill Rossetti, the superintendent, and Michelle Rosendi, the business manager. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you, and I want to say thank you for your indulgence with us this evening. We, I know we're a little late getting you here. Uh, we had a 6 o'clock uh, start time, but unfortunately, um, we've had business that has carried over, so we do appreciate your time. No problem. Uh, okay. Um, is, I would like to give you the opportunity. Um, if you would like to perhaps just open up with some comments, anything of that nature, and then we can get down to asking some questions. Sure. Um, I did provide a presentation. Um, I don't know if you want me to go through the whole thing or if you feel that it was... No, if you could just summarize. I mean, we've had the opportunity. Sure. The, the, the members of the committee have had the opportunity to read the uh, information you have sent us. Um, so it, it just in the, it's in the form of just any kind of an introduction you want to make to okay. try to transition us into the questioning. Sure. So okay. um, as you know, um, you know Blue Hills, we're we're moving right along. We've we've went through a, a couple of crazy years, which I think everybody has at this moment. Um, we spent a lot of time doing um, creating this budget by. Uh, focusing more on our needs versus our wants. Um, mm -hmm. And you can see, you know, the overall increase on this budget um, in, in its entirety is 3.8%. Um, and I, I feel like that really uh, speaks to the amount of work that the district has done to ensure that we're spending our money and aligning it with our strategic goals. Um, as well as being very conscious on, um, you know, the financial restraints of our nine sending districts um, and also the fact that, you know, we did just have a building project a couple of years ago and um, we're, we're just really trying to make sure that we stay within um, a reasonable increase but also still be able to provide the same education um, and supports to our staff and students. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, all right, so I'm going to ask the, the, my fellow committee members uh, for any questions or comments they may have, and we'll start with Council of Flaherty. No, I have no questions at this time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councilor Maglio. Um, I have a question if you could walk us through just a little bit about um, some of the enrollment numbers. Sure. Uh, specifically, so um, as you can tell, most of your assessment increase is because we did have a increase of um, students from Braintree. Uh, your October 1 numbers went from um, 128 uh, last year to 145 this year. And if you have the budget book, it's actually broken down on page uh, 36. So you had an increase of 17 students um, for enrollment this year, which um, was, if you look on the last page of the budget book. Oh, 
this one. And I probably should have worn my glasses. I don't mind. Um, which you had, we had, you had 55 percent of your applicants um, that were accepted, and 37 percent of that 55 um, percent actually chose. Um, to actually enroll at Blue Hills. Um, that is kind of general. If you look at your last column, that's your general four-year average. So you are kind of averaging that um, same increase year over year uh, to Blue Hills. We have two different books here, so thank oh, you no, for no bearing problem. with us here. <laughs> no problem. Right. Um, if you wanted to look at page 38, there's a couple of different um, enrollment um, charts that we do. Uh, your um, enrollment changes over time for three, five, and seven years. It's the second uh, chart on that page. You know, kind of gives you a really good outlook of, you know, what your enrollment changes have been and what the trends are um, with the Braintree students. Um, your enrollment change over the last three years um, was 10 students, but five years, negative 15 students. So... Um, negative? Yes. Right. So okay. five-year average was negative 15 students, but your three-year average is 10 students. Mm -hmm. And on average, your assessment changes, if you wanted to look at the, the, the next chart on that sheet, um, over the last three years, your, increases, your assessment increases due to um, mainly probably um, the enrollment, um, mm -hmm. additional enrollment has been 5% on average. Thank you for that. Yes. So did you see, it doesn't appear as though there was any real COVID um, related change in your enrollment we actually, overall? We actually, I think, had an increase um, of uh, interest in our district during the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, I think a lot more students are looking towards vocational ed or, you know, a lot of things I, th I believe in the midst of COVID, I think with everyone and, and including um, students coming um, up into the high school is thinking about your future, thinking about the, the different opportunities and um, just what the skills in this regional blueprint um, are our regional blueprint, um, what we offer for the different types of opportunities and jobs, um, and also, you know, for students to move forward. Another thing with Blue Hills is, um, although we are a vocational school and we are focused of uh, teaching a trade and, and, and putting a student into the employment world, um, a lot of our students still do go off um, to college as well. So it kind of, I think Blue Hills gave that opportunity for kids to be like, I can go there and learn a trade and go off to school, but if I still want to go to college, there's that support in line um, there as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. I have no more questions. Okay. Thank you. Uh, all right. So. I'm curious if you can help walk through. I'm looking at uh, pages 40 and 41. And per pupil, excuse me, per pupil costs yep. on a three year history. So it doesn't, it appears to me that a, uh, each community pays, can pay a different cost per <laughs> pupil. Yes. Right? Yep. And I do see that. So there you are with uh, your total uh, Blue Hills per pupil assessment. That's a constant, right? 2.44. No. 2. Nope. So, 
I'll explain to you what the, the difference. Okay. So your okay. per pupil required contribution is actually um, kind of the reason that each district changes um, with what they pay in per pupil, because it's what the state determines your required contribution should be to the district, to education in your towns. That's determined by your um, uh, ability to pay um, for your town also the, um, Hold on, let me pull something up, so. Of course, I can't find it in this paper. Um, but it, it's determined by each town's ability to pay, which is based off of their uh, median income in the town and also their property values. I was gonna try and give you the exact calculation, but. You can look it up on the... the okay, um, so generally chapters. speaking, I think you may have answered my question where I was yes. going with this. What determines the per pupil cost? And really it comes down to is uh, the state keeping yes. the data of understanding uh, the medium income for a, a, a participating community mm -hmm. and then also um, there was the medium income and the uh, what property was the, value property value thank yep. you property value okay um in, in i'm looking at these numbers right now mm -hmm. and it, it it jumps out at me um you can see the correlation of what you just said yes with my understanding um of the various communities that are part of the blue hills regional district yep okay Great. Okay. Um, what do you see as your greatest need this year over last year? Um, and also, if you could comment uh, on the, you had made a mention about the capital uh, improvements that were made uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, mm -hmm. And that project, um, is, it, is it a completed project? And how does that play into your needs and where you see yourself going over the next couple of years? Sure. Um, for the building project, it is a completed project, but we have not gotten final sign-off from the MSBA, so we have not received all of our re reimbursement um, from them at this moment. Uh, mm -hmm. They have postponed due to not having their meetings in person, I guess, to do the final um, sign-off. It was supposed to be last November. Okay. We've been kind of pushed out a couple of times. We're hoping... Um, preliminary, maybe August, um, which at that point we'll, we'll be able to determine what our final reimbursements are and then fully um, go out to bond for the remainder of the project. Um, so in terms of the project and that, in my mind and in, in most, it's kind of a done deal. We're there, we've, uh, you know, everything that we have asked for or negotiated for has been done. Um, we're really just kind of waiting on the MSBA for that to close it out completely. Uh, for projects moving forward, we have actually had a new facility director um, that joined, actually right, was hired on right when I was hired on two years ago in the midst of COVID. Um, and what he has tasked himself with for the last two years is really developing a great capital plan, um, especially since you know we, we now have a building that we did all the major work to, but he also has the um, task of picking through the things that weren't completed by the project mm -hmm. um, or also may have been ignored over the last however many years. Um, so some of the things that we're doing right now and also planning on doing in the future, just a couple of quick ones, and it's funny because I just listened to the conversation of the parking lot, but we are addressing our parking lot. Um, and uh, we will be going out to bid for that. That was part of this year's plan. Um, and that's going to be completely seal coated and our um, sidewalks repaired. It is not in great condition. And I understand your um, uh, 
comments about the high school parking lot and having students, um, a lot of students um, coming in and out and staff coming in and out of that proc, um, parking lot. Mm -hmm. So we also have that concern. So that will be one of the capital projects this year. Um, for next year, we have some uh, air quality projects that we're doing um, with our LPN uh, space and our gymnasium. Um, they were not addressed in our building project. Um, we are also looking into an electronic sign, which helps us with communication with our stakeholders um, and just being visible um, where we are. Um, another uh, project is um, electrical testing that wasn't uh, performed um, within the building project. And then I'm trying to think of what the, do you? We have some stuff to do with the pool. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. And then next year, uh, uh, some of our plans, um, which, which most likely won't fully be coming out of the general fund because we do rent out our pool, um, but repairs to the pool. Um, and an old sewerage line. And okay. an old sewerage line. Thank you. Okay. Um, so do you see of any uh, of these things as you're talking about what's coming up over mm -hmm. the horizon, you, you, you've, you've addressed your needs. Yes. Right? Very clear on that. And so... Um, I'm not seeing large capital requests, essentially what you talked about, mm -hmm. um, you know, air quality, uh, that, 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 okay, from a capital perspective, I, I'm just going to throw a number out. Maybe it's going to cost a couple hundred thousand dollars. I, I don't even think that much. Really? Um, we, okay. we did an inis initial estimate. Um, on the what needs to be done in the gym and the LPN, and it's probably around seventy-five thousand. Okay, even better, yep. even better. So, you know, it, the reason I ask is to try to anticipate what our town's needs are going to be in order to meet the, you know, our portion of that spend mm -hmm. uh, of that request, if yes. you will. Um, so it doesn't look like there's anything major similar to what had just transpired with the uh, with the MSB no, no, project. No, no, no. I think okay. we're in really great yeah. shape, and and luckily, like through COVID, because of that renovation, um, we were able to focus those um, COVID relief funds and um, the other funds on you know um, supports or one-time purchases for the classroom. Um, that's really kind of where we focused those funds, which in turn was gave us the ability to present this budget at um, such a um, smaller ask than okay. I than I we initially had expected, you know, years ago when we were doing our projections. So. Well, that's good news. That's a good piece of news that came out of COVID. Yeah, <laughs> we can say. And that building project. <laughs> right. Exactly. So you get a twofer. Yes. Uh, all right. Uh, and. Speaking of aid, COVID-related aid, mm -hmm. um, are you eligible, is Blue Hills Regional High School eligible to directly apply for the county? Uh, we are not. ARPA? We, no, we, we are not. We would um, apply through our districts, but we felt like we, gave, we had the opportunity to go back to our member towns and ask mm -hmm. them for pieces of their COVID relief funds or ESSER funds um, and such. Uh, but we felt like because we had had the building project and, um, you know, kind of um, didn't have to spend the money on the air quality, which was a lot of people's biggest expenses in school yeah. districts around when it came to that, that uh, we were in a, better, a good enough place where we didn't have to go ask towns who had seven schools or 10 schools who probably didn't have updated um, uh, systems for a piece of their funds, so. Great, okay, okay. Uh, I guess my only other question would be not, it, it, you've answered my questions as they pertain to the budget specific and the budget requests. Mm -hmm. You've given me some background information that makes me feel more comfortable about things. Um, going forward, just from a curriculum, this is more our curiosity from my perspective. Mm -hmm. Going forward from a curricular, curriculum standpoint, do you see uh, any of the types of uh, training opportunities changing or evolving because of just the way uh, I guess society and technology is changing, or you still feel as if that um, the curriculum, the core curriculum that you provide from a trades perspective, a vocation perspective, mm -hmm. are still very, very relevant. 
if I may. I'm, sure. I'm not sure if they said it. My hearing's not too good. Um, you asked what the school really needs. Bigger school. A uh, bigger school. This year alone, uh, parents are looking uh, at the future of their children. Five hundred and over thirty students Two. applied for Blue Hills. That's more than half uh, what we can accept. So since COVID, the parents are looking, do the kids really need to go to college? Are they getting uh, work when they get out of college? And Blue Hills isn't, it's not a second um, direction. A lot of the kids from Blue Hills go to secondary um, colleges, uh, two year, four year, military, uh, other ITs. So we're not trying to just stick these kids in one location and say, hey, this is what you're gonna do the rest of your life. It's a choice they have. It's an extra benefit that a lot of kids do not have going to their regular uh, town schools. And I'm a great advocate for it. Class of 81, Beach R. Um, <laughs> just had my 41st. All right. So um, I really do push the school. I know some uh, people here probably had students there, and um, myself. And well, so. Uh, I'm sorry. So that's that's what we really need—a bigger school, but <laughs> a uh, bigger don't school. Don't we all? Um, you know, Holbrook is busting at the seams. I think they'd be over the limit if we didn't take some of their students out of the town, and I think uh, the other towns also. So when we did the project, uh, and also Holbrook has a brand new school. I call it a tri-school. Uh, it's all three elementary, middle, and high school all in one building, uh, which is separated. But they're busting at the seams. Uh, we have a lot of construction going on down there right now, and. Um, Hopefully they can get some more money from the state, but I wish we were able to get some more money for the state just to add on a, a few classrooms that, so we could take more kids into this program. So that's all, thank you. Well, I tell you, I, I agree. Blue Hills is a tremendous asset for young kids today. Mm -hmm. I know a number of, of young people who have gone there and have done very well for themselves. Mm -hmm. It's an alternative route than the traditional college, mm -hmm. you know, degree program. However, I've also noted that the educational standards uh, that these kids are getting, the high, you're getting higher and higher numbers, kids getting accepted to, co to, to colleges. Yes. That before it was just, as to Eric's point, uh, it was more like you go in there to get a vocation, get out of high school, and I'm done with school type of thing. It, it, it's, it's, it's so it's much more than that. definitely not that anymore. Blue Hills, yeah, yeah. right. And I think all vocational schools, um, you know, there's really been a focus on creating those career pathways, but also uh, college pathways within vocational schools. It's been a, a focus for a number of years at the state um, level as well. So, um, you know, we're just moving with the times and, and hoping that we're being able to provide um, for these students um, these extraordinary education. Uh, one of the things I did want to say is um, for curriculum wise, because you had asked about curriculum, right now we're in the curriculum review cycle. So that is where our academic director um, works with all of our teachers and in aligning our curriculum with the state standards. Am I saying that correctly? Mm -hmm. I don't usually talk in academic terms, so bear with me. Um, but uh, so we do constantly, just like um, the other school districts, we go through that curriculum cycle, we make sure that we're aligning. Um, we've focused, we've spent a lot of time in the last year um, doing some data panels um, where we uh, are gathering, we have a, a data, what do they call it? Team. A, a data team that um, is working together. Uh, we were using some uh, data sprints in order to gather a lot of information that they're um, analyzing about, you know, what are we providing? Is it meeting all of the standards? What do people want? It, there's a lot of data that's coming in that we're trying to use that to make sure that we're aligning our education with the strategic plan that we've worked on um, for the last two years. So. That sounds terrific. That sounds terrific. Okay, do we have any further questions from any of the council 
Members, committee members. Okay. All right. Well, um, I don't have anything further. I feel as if that the questions have been satisfactorily answered. Thank you. We appreciate you giving us some more insight, uh, particularly from the, uh, the, um, the tuition billing model. Sure. Uh, it gives me a, a bit more clarity, and it's very helpful. So, uh, yes. Twenty twenty-two at six p.m. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Mr. Awesome. Mr. Chairman, what is the reason to table it to May 9th? It says on my paper. <laughs> oh, <so laughs> well, if you if well, you, we can approve. If I mean, you have um, feel that you have met the needs of this um, presentation, you can make a motion for a favorable recommendation. Um, and then that will be taken up on the 31st. For just this portion? Just for the Blue Hills. Yeah, like right. so. You're, you're going to make an, uh, you, you want to make a favorable recommendation on the budget if you believe that. If you want to table it, that means you want them to come back. So I was just tabling it because I know that we have a great deal more budget to discuss, and I thought the budget was one whole yeah. oh. thing. Well then, I am happy to make a motion to favorably recommend Order 22025. Do we have to untake it? Miss, Miss, no, you. Mr. Clerk and Mr. Chairman, first there was already a motion and a second, and I think it was voted. But also what we've been doing, um, what we did last evening with the four budgets that were presented was the entirety of the budget was tabled to the subsequent evening. And what I would anticipate is that the, at the final hearing, the budget, as was suggested by Councilor Flaherty, okay. would be voted as a whole. And it's the, the revolving funds and the community preservation accounts that get voted separately. Okay, when, when is the final meeting that you have uh, scheduled for? Because it should be tabled for that night. There's, no need to have it be taken up by the well if, the night. Uh, outside outside of any callbacks, which I do not anticipate this this item being called back. Okay, so motion it uh, amend the motion. It, again, Mr. Clerk, though the, the each depart each program doesn't have an independent motion number, where the right. entire budget has one motion number. This committee will be taking up the budget again on May 9th. Right, so we'll be continuing each evening of the meeting that we have concerning the overall budget to table until we get to the night where we have reviewed every item of the budget and we're able to make a vote. I believe that's correct, Mr. Right. Chairman. Okay, I do appreciate both of you walking through that with us. I mean, this is, uh, I mean, there are so many different motions. Okay, thank you. So at this point, we don't need to take any further action. Just a motion to adjourn. Motion, all right, so we're not going to take, uh, wait a minute, what did I see here? That was revolving, was, all of these have been continued. All right. Do they know when they need to come back, if they need to come back at all? Thirty first is town meeting. We we generally do um, okay. come for your town meeting. Very good. Okay. Then we will see you on the thirty first. Perfect. We appreciate your time this Thank evening. You. Thank you so much. We appreciate okay. it. Okay. So, do we have a motion to adjourn? That's what they call it. Yeah. So moved. Second. We all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, everybody. Thank Good night. you. Good night. Thank you for your time.